Hey, it's MJ. Oh. MJ's not dead. Oh, I'm, I'm always very pleasantly surprised when we find out that MJ Current has not accidentally um, uh, self removed, self removed from reality. I, I think that a, I, 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 I want to point out, not a purposeful no, just self, no, like like an incidental self removal. Yeah, you know. I or, feel like that's quite a few of our of our um, our, our subscribers and, and internet uh, uh, friends. Is that? At least one other, <laughs> are including we Mr. Are, are we causing people to undertake like dangerous activities to the point that we're worried about their safety? They they watch us and they're just like, "Wow, these guys are so." I have to go do something with my life now. This is <laughs> this, this this show of absolute mediocrity makes me want to go do something with my life. I believe that. I believe that. Though MJ MJ specifically just is constantly. Constantly finding themselves in ludicrous situations. Luda, it's meaner, and meaner every time. Indeed, it does. Indeed, it does. Uh, with that out of the way, <laughs> with that out of the way. Hello, I'm Connor, and I'm Sam. We are not brothers, nor are we in a dungeon. This is a Dungeon Bros podcast, and I did that in the reverse order. This is the Dungeon Bros podcast. I'm kind of, is normally the, the yeah, spiel. Yeah. yeah, we're we're mixing it up. We're getting we wild, but we're just not forgetting, which is the important part. That is, yep. Yep. Uh, for those of you watching at home, listening at home, which you might be, you might be thinking, "Wow, this episode is unreasonably late." Yeah, yeah. Uh, which actually ties into our sponsor a little bit. Yeah, uh, thunderstorms. Uh, thunderstorms. A, a July. They have this July special going on right now, where if they show up in your town, uh, they'll kill your computers with power surges for free for free as just a free bonus for walking into the thunderstorm shop and uh, making a purchase uh they want to point out they've been killing pcs in power surges since 1953 we're very proud of that uh thank you thunderstorms for sponsoring the dungeon bros podcast uh please support us because i now need to buy a new computer yeah <laughs> uh you might be watching the tiktok live but saying connor there's a laptop in front of you and it's the same one you use every week yes i have a desktop computer that i edit the podcast on so i now have to do it on my laptop also yesterday was normally when we record the podcast it was july 4th yep huzzah 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 i spent the day uh playing actual DD, which mm-hmm. is surprisingly not something as as two guys who have a DD podcast i feel like we we don't play nearly play, D&D. no we don't uh, we really don't and we and we don't play like any more together no, we had several campaigns going all at once. I think I think we went too hard too fast in the campaign department. I agree. I think we need like one. Just yes. one. Yes. For for the for the house game. The Dungeon Bros home studio game. I I'd, I'd be even even willing to like put it up to like a uh, do sh- a shorter not so extended yes. campaign. Yes. Cuz not we only like, do we like to DM, our we have some friends who also yeah like to dm i agree i agree i think well i i would still love to run call of the nether deep i will probably end up reserving that for a digital game uh because i have friends that want to play D and they live acro- in various places and we would end up having to play digitally how dare they i know right the audacity uh the auda- the lion the witch and the audacity of that bitch uh, so I'll probably end up running that there because I am hell bent on running Call of the Nether Deep because it's a cool adventure. You have been yes, you have been hard. I'm a fan of that. Hard on for that one for a I'm while. A fan of that, but I would be totally, I'd be totally fine with like, all right, guys, I'm I'm gonna do five sessions mm-hmm. for the next two months, yeah. two three months, whatever. I'd be into that, sexual style, oh. specifically. Uh, uh, I will maybe play in a different game in that case. Why are you looking at me like that? Chat you know send why. help. You know why. <laughs> All right, let's go through the regular bullshit. Um, SCG Con Cincinnati is coming up very, very soon. Uh, if you are watching this or listening to this when it is posted, it'll be next weekend, Friday, July 14th, 15th, and 16th. Sam and I are going to be there. We're going to be playing so much Magic the Gathering. Just so much Magic the Gathering. We have devious plans, uh, specifically in the two headed giant commander realm. Yes. Ivy Gleeful Spell Thief, one of Sam's oldest decks, along with Feather the Redeemed in mine. And we're going to be so many combat tricks, so many copying onto Ivy, so many returning cards to my hand to then subsequently do it again every single turn. It's going to be uh, Ridiculous. fucking Luda. Uh, also, not two weeks later, we'll be at Gen Con in Indianapolis, Indiana. That is going to be August 3rd to the 6th. The best four days in gaming. 
And the Dungeon Bros are going to be a part of that. Yes. Also playing lots of Magic the Gathering. We're also going to be staying with many content creator friends. Uh, many many members of the role-playing degenerates here on TikTok. Steve and Cisco, I believe, for sure. Yeah, I believe so. I don't know so. if Chris is going yet. We'll find out. And we're also trying to get. We're also trying to see if there's any other creators or other friends within our sphere, uh, because we're going to have a massive Airbnb. But you can see us if you're going to Gen Con. Please come and say hi. Or we'd, we'd be happy. We we'd love to see you. You know, I was. I'm still a, a year later. Still shocked that we got recognized at last Gen Con yeah. by anybody. That was super cool. We were wearing wearing masks and everything. Yeah, it, yeah. It was full. It was full post COVID, but we're acting like it's still COVID times. Times. You know. Not yeah. That was that's a good clarification. It was, they were they were face masks for yes. for health reasons. Not uh, we weren't cosplaying. No, no. Or we were neither were we masking, if you will. I mean, I'm constantly like masking in public. You know. Or right now we're masking. Well, sure. As well. So but that's just that's just kind of that's just kind of podcast etiquette, really. Yeah. See, if you get too real, if you get too real, then it like it's like oh whoa, <laughs> <laughs> why are you sharing these details online? <laughs> All good. Um, obviously today we, we're, we're going to talk about 1D&D. Yes. The sixth play test for 1D&D. Got a lot of things. We finally get to see the monk. Yes. Very exciting. For a long time for that. Get some updates for the bard, the cleric, the druid, the rogue, the ranger, the paladin. All good times. All good things. I think I, overview, I think it's pretty good. What I've I've had uh, some time to look at it, and I like a lot of the changes that they've made to the changes that they've already made. Um, and we'll go over this later more, but yeah. of course they said that they're moving into a refinement uh, uh, era, if you will, of their of their playtest material. Yeah. And they even said right out of the gate when they started doing these one D and D playtests that it was more of a we're just going we're we're our initial changes are going to be absolutely crazy and off the wall and way too far and see how far that boundary is for people because there's some that they pushed it really far and people were like yes more you know what i'm saying yeah. uh but now they've reined it they've reined things in a lot and it's going to be much more similar to what you're used to but before we get into all that there's a there's two big magic the gathering things going on in the world the one of one serialized one ring card from the tales of middle earth lord of the rings set that is in collector boosters has been found yeah and it has been graded uh so it's real it's authenticated Mm -hmm. and i have to admit i am utterly shocked that i was that i was wrong that it wasn't in a uh, gift bundle i would have bet a non insignificant amount of money that it was going to end that it was going to be in a gift bundle or released in a wave of collector boosters after the gift bundle came out. Mm. So in my in my mind, if I'm Wizards of the Coast, it's like there's only one of these cards. We better fucking ensure that it's gonna be graded as a ten. Maybe have it graded themselves and then just put the graded card in a gift bundle yeah. with a collector booster and the regular boosters. Sure. But people would have been pissed because it wouldn't have actually been in a pack and they wouldn't have actually been able to open it, which means they wouldn't they would have been lying technically. But I, I, that's that's a whole thing. You know, when you when you try to do this whole Charlie and the Chocolate Factory golden ticket situation, yeah. you're always going to have some sort of uh, some sort of, you know, difference of opinion of how you should have done it when you should have done. But, hey, they it was found. And uh, it's really cool. It's really cool. I. I'm sure they want to try and replicate that fervor again. I don't know. I think I can't. It will never be as good. It's Lord of the Rings. It, it, there is so specific that there is a a one of one of they a thing they could have done the one of one of one with. Yeah. Like there's no way that you know. If, I can't even think of another thing in the future that that they have planned. Like <sighs> universes beyond, they have uh, Doctor Who, which is just a, a big commander set. A one of, maybe maybe a one of one for each Doctor. <laughs> It's some sort of serialized. Well, oh, there's, there's no packs to open. They're all commander decks, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's true. But that's then true. next year we know Final Fantasy and Assassin's Creed. I keep forgetting about that. The Final Fantasy set's gonna be so fucking cool. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, none of those things that they have announced and have planned really have that sort of thing. Maybe yep. another 10, 15 years down the road, though. We'll see. I would. I I could totally see them revisiting a Lord of the Rings universes beyond set in five to ten. Plus years. I think that'd be cool. There's so I much more. Uh, there's the they could have go. The they Hobbit. called the, the whole Hobbit uh, uh, area the, time the, era. The entire the entire Middle Earth legendarium that mm-hmm. exists between the Silmarillion, uh, the Fall of Gondol. Like there's so many books and things that have been created post death from J.R.R. Tolkien, just from his massive unwieldy collection of writings. 
Uh, the Legendarium is massive, and they could they could make sets. They could make Magic the Gathering sex sets sex. Jeez. Jeez. They could make Magic the Gathering sets just for Lord of the Rings for years mm-hmm. and not exhaust all of the depth that is there. Yeah. In my mind. Uh, the other big Magic the Gathering thing is a big little controversy. A big little controversy <laughs> between the term... With, with pertaining specifically to the term tribal. Now, for those of you that don't know in Magic the Gathering, if you build a deck of cards, 40, 60, 100, whatever format, if you have a lot of cards, particularly creature types, that are the same. So we build a deck, and it's got a lot of elves in it, built around elf synergies and yes. stuff. It would be called elf tribal. There are other terms as well. Elf ball. Um, I've... I don't know. Will elf Ferrell. De- just Will, Will Ferrell. Ferrell. <laughs> just elf deck in general. Or... Just an elf deck. Uh, elf tribal is the shorthand to refer. So it's like, oh, I've got, what is this deck? Oh, well, it's it's red, green, and white. It's got blah, blah, blah. It's, and the, it's a dino tribal, so it's dinosaurs. or vamp- I have I have a vampire tribal deck here. I've got, uh, I've got the werewolf tribal deck, all that kind of stuff, where it's predominantly those creature types. Uh, in a recent blog post from Wizards of the Coast, they talked about how internally at Wizards of the Coast, they're moving away from using the term tribal when referring to the style of cards and decks where there's a bunch of creature types of the same thing. And that's after a review from uh, like a third party entity that was going over their uh, their operations and seeing where things might be quote unquote problematic. So internally they're going forward using the term typal mm-hmm. instead of tribal to refer to a collection where uh, of similar types. Um, this is an internal thing. It's tribal has never been like really an official term of, outside of uh, uh, card types like uh, tribal in, uh, tribal instance and tribal. Yeah, it was a weird. Stuff. It was a weird mechanic they tried a couple uh, several years ago. Uh, and it never, they only printed a few, um, and they really didn't have anything to do with the card types that they were associated with. Yeah. Like, there were some, there were goblin tribal cards. Uh, the only thing that was goblin about them was the art. The effect yeah. had nothing in particular. Uh, they are, there are, you know, when you can search, you know, oh, you can select this many different types of cards. Like, there's an attract that allows you to mm-hmm. pull uh, X many cards from one of each type. Tribal does technically fall into that, um, but other than that, yeah. it's not a it's not a mechanical thing necessarily. Yes. Uh, ultimately, if you want to use the term typal, who cares? I don't care. Say whatever you want to say. Um, if someone wants to use the word tribal, I don't care. Say what you want to say. I don't think it's offensive, personally. So uh, my, uh, you know, like I said, it's uh, they had cultural consultants uh, say that tribal is not a good term for them to use, and that makes that's fine. Inter- and, internally in an office environment, whatever. When it comes cover your ass, I get that. When it comes to what it should be called in the community, uh, that's that's a thing that they have to rely on the community to decide for themselves. Yeah. If the community wants to move away from tribal and go with typal, go with ball. Often these decks are called mm-hmm. balls. Um, balls, balls. <laughs> so uh, elf balls. testicle is my Ooh, is my choice going forward. Um, but yeah, so this is up to the community. I think at this point to yeah. make whatever choice they want to make. If if you were on Twitter, this was the biggest controversy that has ever happened for Magic the Gathering, and people were acting like it. Um, it's not. It's fine. It's not a big deal. Say words are words. <laughs> words are just words. It's fine. Like we're not using. It's not like anybody's using racial slurs to describe their their deck. God, I hope not. That I mean, I'm sure. I am sure there are people that do that, and that's wrong. You can never say. You can never say. Oh, nobody's doing it. Like, of course, someone's probably doing it, and they're stupid. Yeah, there's. Well, that goes to the entirety of uh, a lot of nerd culture is is still a little backwater in that. <laughs> yeah. And like, well, gatekeeping is a big thing, but also, yeah, using uh, some racial insensitivity. I mean, we just talked a, a couple weeks ago about TSR. Oh yeah. Uh, a, <laughs> I a still a can't believe that they now only bankrupt <laughs> uh, three year old re- revitalized company that right. had a lot of racial uh, yeah. and uh, other sorts of um, not good. Uh, inappropriately charged content uh, failed and and their their top line revenue man 
hundreds of dollars. Notice I didn't say hundreds of thousands. Hundreds, as in under $1,000 in revenue, which is absolutely hilarious. Check out the last episode of the podcast for that. But... We do the re- upcoming re- releases real quick. Yes. Run through those. Dungeons and Dragons. Big B presents the Glory of Giants, August 15th. Also on that same day, the Practically Complete Guide to Dragons. You got the Fandelver and Below and the Shatter Obelisk on September 19th. I've been seeing some ads for this and I've, I've seen like the cover art on mm-hmm. it. Like oh, especially yeah. the fancy one. Looks real nice. Uh, Planescape, Adventures of the Multiverse, October 16th. The Book of Many Things, November 14th. Lord of the Rings is out and they're going to get a supplement set in November uh, November third. They're also it's also where they're doing like the extra like the special collector like scene, art scenes art with the easels. Uh, probably not a good deal, depending on what cards specifically are printed and how much they're valued at whatever. Uh, Commander Masters upcoming in August, August fourth. Wilds of Eldraine. We're getting pre release September first. The launch September eighth. Doctor Who Commander decks October thirteenth. And the Lost Caverns of Ixalan at some point in November twenty twenty three. Those are the releases for the year. But now, we come to this massive 77-page PDF containing Playtest 6 of the 2023 Unearthed Arcana Player's Handbook. They go over the Cleric, the Druid, the Monk, the Paladin, the Ranger, and the Rogue, as well as many subclasses, two of which are entirely new. The College of Dance for the Bard, as well as the Circle of the Sea Druid. How there hasn't been a Circle of the Sea Druid so far, I think is dumbfounding. I... I thought they. I thought there might there was one, but there might have been one we, in uh, in a Unearth Arcana previously. We were talking about doing a homebrew of a circle were of we? the sea druid. That's I think how it's inspirational on. we are to me. Exactly, exactly. Um, but the, all the sea stuff was handled in like the the circle of the land, where you could pick what thing, like what mm-hmm. landscape you're from. Uh, anyway, we're just going to go over. The uh, change logs, the design notes for all of the different classes. Uh, there's some new spells, not a ton. Some features that have been made spells. Some spells that have been made features. It's a whole, it's a whole thing. But first, we're going to talk about the bard. Alphabetical order. Design note updates for the bard. First up, bardic inspiration is returned to the 2014 form of bardic inspiration with the following changes. One. A Bardic Inspiration die is used in response to failing a d20 test. You no longer have to guess whether you failed. And two, a creature has up to an hour, not just 10 minutes, to use the die. The healing option in the previous Bard playtest has been removed because in playtesting, the healing option was encouraging too much usage hoarding, which easily resulted in the Bard not using Bardic Inspiration at all. That is fair. I think the healing option was nice. But I get what they're saying, yeah. as especially if you if the bard is your healer, which they do have access to healing spells. Yeah. But I agree, you you want to give some separation. You want to use your cool things. Yes, and use if you're the hoarding. cool thing and the hour duration. Great. Oh, much better. Using it in response to failing a check, as opposed to being like, ah, this might fail. I'll go ahead and use it. I think that's good as well. Mm-hmm. There's so many times where di- where the they require you to expend things and then say before you know, but before you have to choose yeah. this before. Yeah. Um. It's the same mentality as, as the guidance cantrip that they updated, where you mm-hmm. use it as a reaction when someone fails, as opposed to just constantly like pinging it on people. Yeah. Uh, spellcasting has two noteworthy changes. One, each bard gets to choose whether they use the arcane, divine, or primal spell list. And two, spell preparation is no longer tied to the level of your spell slots. The first change leans into the fact that the bard might have learned their arts in an arcane, a divine, or a primal context, and the second change was a widely requested in uh, previous player feedback on playtest material. Uh, being able to pick your spell list, interesting. Mm-hmm. Open oh, lets the bard be a lot more flexible. Yeah, it really gives them. They're supposed to be an expert, yes. so they get to that makes sense. And then of course, well, and and then that's of course only important for your first ten levels because mm-hmm. at level ten you then get access to all the yeah. lists. Uh, those are the bigger changes. Uh, we're going to run through the rest here. Jack of all trades has returned to a second level feature. Uh, that is what it is in the original player's handbook. Bard subclass levels now match the level progression of the 2014 bard, ensuring compatibility with subclasses already in print. Font of inspiration has returned to fifth level. And is now, and it now also allows you to expend spell slots to use Bardic Inspiration if you are out of uses. Counter Charm returns and has been improved. It's now seventh level and can be used as a reaction rather than an action. A 
big improvement. Yes. Uh, Magical Secrets has returned to 10th level and now affects your spell choice for all your later bard levels. Uh, and then Words of Creation is a new 20th level feature replacing the Epic Boon. Epic Boon feats will return in a future UA, but they won't be built into a class's level progression. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, it seems like they're going to give the classes all their big 20th level capstone feature, uh, much like it was in the original. Uh, the customizability of the Epic Boon was nice, but um, it, it, it did leave each class a little bit hollow on the top end, mm -hmm. like a little bit too customizable and a little bit too cookie cutter in a way. Yeah, and also the epic boons themselves were, I think, good for what they were originally intended for in the, in the 2014 edition, which was, here is another thing you can, another reward for your players when they do something big. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah, tying it to the the 20th level, a lot of them were just very disappointing. It's like. It's supposed to be my twentieth level thing. Why are you? Why are you uh, kneecapping me already? Or yeah. as as the last act of of this game, why are you kneecapping me? Yeah, exactly. All right, let's run through these features real quick. Of course, at first level, you get bardic inspiration. It starts out as a d six. You use it as a bonus action. Uh, you can inspire another creature within sixty feet of yourself that can see or hear you. Gains one of your bardic inspiration dice can only have one at a time once within the next hour when the creature fails a d20 test can roll that die add the number to the d20 potentially turning a failure into a success number of uses you confer a bardic inspiration die a number of times equal to your charisma modifier minimum of one you regain all when you finish a long rest at higher levels the die increases to a d8 at fifth a d10 at 10 and a d12 at 15th level also at first level you get your spell casting you choose a spell list arcane divine or primal the chosen list is your bard spell list and represents the magical tradition in which you have learned uh, whenever whichever list you choose it also includes the vicious mockery cantrip i'm going to jump down real quick here to spells and i'm going to pull up vicious mockery Zam, what do you think of the bardic inspiration while i do this um so i do like the again like we just mentioned uh not having to choose but you know not having to to, to waver over whether you do want to use it or not at any given point especially because a lot of the times uh you might want to hold it for a more useful situation in a high or a high stress situation and then giving you an hour is mm -hmm. Just much more reasonable because 10 minutes, you know, D&D &D is broken down into time a lot, but 10 minutes is not one of those t allotted times that it's often broken down to. It's either usually a m less than a minute yeah. or an hour or greater. Yeah, I agree. I agree. The Vicious Mockery Cantrip is a bard-exclusive cantrip now, as it was previously. Mm. Uh, it is, is a casting time of one action, a range of 60 feet, verbal, instantaneous. Big deal here, Sam. Big deal. Target must succeed on a wisdom saving throw or take 1d6 Woo! psychic damage and have disadvantage on the next attack roll it makes before the end of its turn. Die, the You get an additional die of damage at certain levels. Fifth level, it's 2d6. Eleventh level, it's 3d6. And seventeenth level, it is 4d6. Look at that. Look at the bard out there dealing a d6 of cantrip damage. Yeah, that, that d4 of, of damage in the 2014, I think, what, one, one of two cantrips yeah. that did d4s. Yeah. And uh, so why would you ever take it you know it, even yeah. even with or why would you ever use it even with that extra buff still it, not as good as some things they print in it especially in xanathars and tasha's but in in the original player's handbook it's the only damaging cantrip that the bard gets now you always you will always have vicious mockery it's a bit more potent you still get the di you still imp impose the disadvantage all good things the bard is of course a prepared spellcaster same rules as you are all familiar with you can change your prepared spells. Uh, what is that? Whenever you gain a bard level, you can replace one spell on your list with another spell with which you have spell slots that is also on your bard spell list. It's a charisma caster. You get your you get your musical instrument and all that. Level two, you get two features. Expertise, you gain the expertise in two of your skill proficiencies of your choice. Uh, they suggest performance and persuasion, if you are unfamiliar. Uh, Jack of all trades is also the second level feature. You add half your proficiency bonus, rounded down to any ability check you make. Uh, that uses a skill proficiency you lack and doesn't otherwise use your proficiency bonus. Pretty much unchanged. Indeed. Both good features. Third level, you get your bard subclass. We'll go over the four, really three, subclasses 
that they show later. Fourth level, you get an ability score improvement feat or another feat of your choice for which you qualify. At fifth level, you get font of inspiration. You regain all expended uses of your bardic inspiration when you finish a short rest. In addition, if you have no uses of bardic inspiration left, you can give yourself one use by expending a spell slot, no action required. You can do so only once per turn. So now you can turn your first level spell slots into Bardic Inspiration if you so mm -hmm. choose. I don't know why you would be doing that. That doesn't seem like a great trade. It kind of depends on the situation you're in. Yeah, and of course, once you get to higher levels, uh, you may not be using those first level spells as much. Uh, there are some, you know, sometimes when you, you get would. This, when you get this feature, it's fifth level. You're True. still using those first level you're slots. You're still using those first level slots. But in the same way, uh, the sorcerer, the, I think they're moving a bit more towards uh, all the classes kind of have that flexibility that the sorcerer has to yeah. swap between um, spell slots and the special thing. Because mm -hmm. we also see that with uh, the druid here later on getting to switch uh, swap wild shapes for spell slots. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at sixth level, you get your first sub your second subclass feature. At seventh level, you get counter charm, the largely despised and useless feature from the 2014. But now, if you or a creature within 30 feet of you fails a saving throw against an effect that applies the charmed or frightened condition, you can use your reaction to cause the save to be re-rolled, and the new roll has advantage. No limit on the number of uses. As long as your reaction is up, you can impose that reaction. Mm -hmm. You do not have to use an action to activate. You do not have to use an action to maintain. And you, you can use this dynamically, and it imposes advantage for the person making the save as opposed to just letting them re-roll. This is a massive improvement in yeah. my mind. Yeah. For those of you who aren't aware, uh, previously, you, it had to be... Uh, as, a, as an action, you start a performance that lasts until the end of your next turn, during which time you and any friendly creatures within 30 feet of you have advantage on saving throws against being frightened or charmed. Um, a feature that was largely never used. Yeah. It was a preparatory feature as opposed to a, um, a, 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 a reactionary And you feature. can't... There's so few opportunities where you know... I, okay, like, unless you know you're walking into a dragon's den with uh, where they have the frightful presence... Yes. That's about the only time you would use it. So this is, yes, as you were saying, a oh, much better feature. We're fighting, we're fighting a succubus and an incubus. I guess I'll counter charm. Yeah. And you hold your counter charm for the entire fight. I, this is a massive improvement. This makes counter charm very playable, very useful. Uh, highly, highly positive on this Indeed. change. Level eight. You get an ability score improvement feat or another feat of your choice that for which you qualify. Uh, ninth level, you get expertise again, getting uh, two more skill proficiencies of your choice. Tenth level, magical secrets. Magical secrets is different. You no longer are picking individual spells from other lists. At level 10, you just get access to all of the spell lists mm -hmm. for your spell choices. And when you level up, you can swap out spells. So when you hit level 10, you can get access to any spell that you would be able to cast at level 10 from any list. I think this is a much, much simpler way of doing magical secrets, and it's a much better, like a more powerful option. Too. Oh yeah, it's this to try to predict what spells you'll need per level is hard. To yes. try to predict what spells you might need, especially uh, between for the next eight levels, upper levels, mm -hmm. even harder. Yeah. So this is just a nice, a, a nice clean way of doing this. Yep. Bard, bard, bard. They are an expert. In many ways, yeah, they are an expert. And in many ways, they're like one of the ultimate spellcasters because they can cast any spell. They can cast any combinations of spells from across any list. Mm -hmm. There's going to be some very interesting interactions, I think, specifically between the Divine and the Arcane list sure. with spells that you're not normally going to be able to have up at the same time. Very exciting. Twelfth level. You get another ability score improvement feat or another feat of your choice. 14th level, you get a subclass feature. 16th level, the ability score improvement feat or a feat of your choice. 18th level, superior inspiration. When you roll initiative and have no uses of your bardic inspiration left, you regain two expended uses of it. At 19th level, you get an ability score improvement feat or another feat of your choice. And at 20th level, you have a capstone feature, the words of creation. You have mastered two of the prime words of creation, the words of life and death. You therefore always have the power word heal and power word kill 
multiple spells prepared. And when you cast either spell, you can target a second creature with the spell, provided that creature is within 10 feet of the first target. One little note here to make about Power Word Heal, it is no longer a touch spell, it is now a spell that has range, so you can cast it at a bit of a distance and it's a bit easier to finagle that you know, targeting thing. Since it's Power Word Touch or Power Word Heal, that makes sense. It's not Power Caress Heal. It's Power <laughs> Power Word Power Word Heal. Power Power Light Embrace Heal, heal. yeah. <laughs> power uh, a good game butt slap heal. Good game butt slap, yeah. I think Words of Creation would have been a fun feature to like carry through throughout the entire bard, uh, bard class, giving some augmentations for like healing word or some of the other like verbal only mm-hmm. spells that are more support that the bard tends to use. Uh, I think this is a very thematic 20th level feature. It's nice that the previous 20th level feature is now 18th level. <laughs> And it's double what the what yes. the 2014 was. You used to only get one back. Now you get two. Now you get two. Now you get two. In addition, you can swap spell slots for Bardic Inspiration uses, if that is something you so choose. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just th- more uses of your thing. Yeah. Also, targeting two things with Power Word Kill. <laughs> <laughs> they do have to be standing pretty close to each other, but... Still, though. That's awesome. All right. We have three Bard subclasses to talk about. Uh they they there are four class subclasses listed uh one of them for pretty much all the classes is uh in tasha's cauldron of everything uh in this case it would be the college of valor no the college, college of valor, valor is in college of valor is there hold on hold on a moment it's college of glamour College of Dance. Okay, so it's the College of Lore. Lore is in PHB. Yeah, okay. So the College of Lore is... It's Lore and Valor in PHB. It's Glamour in... Well, that doesn't make a lick of sense because the College of Lore has a different whole thing for Magical Secret. No, they're all just four... All four of them are listed here. Interesting. Uh, Sometimes there's a fourth class that is basically just a copy paste. It might just be a copy paste, the Valor Bard. Anyway. We will find out as we review it now. College of Dance... Actually, no, the College of Glamour is the one from Tasha. That's it? what I just said, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> College of Dance is a brand new subclass. Third level, you get Dazzling Footwork. While you aren't wearing an armor... While you aren't wearing armor or wielding a shield, you gain the following benefits. Unarmored Defense. Your base armor class equals 10 plus Dexterity plus your Charisma. Agile Strikes. When you expend a use of your Bardic Inspiration as part of an action, a bonus action, or a reaction... You can make one unarmed strike as part of that action, bonus action, or reaction. Bardic damage. You can use your dexterity instead of strength for the attack rolls of your unarmed strikes, and when you deal damage with an unarmed strike, you can deal bludgeoning damage equal to a roll of your bardic inspiration die plus your dexterity modifier. This roll does not expend the die. Mm -hmm. For those of you that are curious... Or for those of you that don't remember, when we talked about this about five minutes ago, Bardic Inspiration dies. They increase starting out at a D6, then a D8 at level 5, a D10 at level 10, and a D12 at level 15. Does this make the, the College of Dance Bard a better monk than the monk? No. No, <laughs> no it does not. No, but it does give that... Uh, the, bard is, the Bard subclasses are known for reaching into other classes' main yes. features, and there was never really one that was the monk-like yep. one, uh, so this is the uh, this is the equivalent. Yes. Uh, you do have to expend a use of your Bardic Inspiration die for something else to be able to get that unarmed strike. Uh, at third level, you also get Inspiring Movement. When an enemy you can see ends its turn within five feet of an ally of yours who is within 60 feet of you you can use your reaction and expend one use of your bardic inspiration dice to move up to half your speed then roll your bardic inspiration die and the ally can move up to a number of feet equal to five times the number rolled none of the features movements provoke opportunity attacks so you they they stop and you're like hold up i'm gonna uh, run up to them punch them and my body's gonna run away yeah big you do it you do it like a little dance, 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 dance jump and then you do like that, like leg stretch, like jump up, like a ballerina. Yes, yes. And then that's distracting enough that your uh, ally is able to get away. 
Uh, level six, you get leading evasion. When you are subjected to an effect that allows you to make a dexterity saving throw to take only half damage, you instead take no damage if you succeed on the saving throw, and you take only half damage if you fail. If any creatures within five feet of you are making the same dexterity saving throw, you can share this benefit with them for that save. You can't use this feature if you have the incapacitated condition. Also at level six, you get the tandem footwork. When you roll initiative, you can spend one use of your bardic inspiration if you don't have the incapacitated condition. When you do so, roll your bardic inspiration die. Choose a number of creatures within 60 feet of yourself. You can choose yourself up to a number equal to your charisma modifier, minimum of one. Each of them gains a bonus to their initiative equal to the number rolled. Woo! <sighs> bonus initiative with bardic inspiration. Uh, you, you get evasion. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> effectively, in, uh, with, changes evasion to, with extra steps. <laughs> evasion with extra stuff, which is cool. Um, but more the the tandem footwork is a little more interesting to me because there's not that many things that modify initiative yeah. or have the opportunity to modify initiative mm-hmm. um, in the base game. So it's interesting to see that they're playing with it a little bit. Yeah, I mean, initiative is is a role that I think has a bit more importance placed on it in the community than it really has. It's very iconic uh, to say role initiative. But the actual role... But the actual role itself. You could have a great combat with an initiative of two. You could have a terrible combat with an initiative of 24. And it, it also depends on you know how your party is as a combat unit and how your DM plays. If the DM lets, has the enemies do prep work so they come in all buffed up, yeah. it's one thing. But if, you know, obviously if they don't, then you'd rather have a higher initiative to uh, to be able to get them before they buff up. Anyway, but yes. it's something that's not often uh, modified. Yes. Uh, at 14th level, you get Irresistible Dance. You always have Otto's Irresistible Dance prepared. That is a spell. Mm-hmm. You can cast it without expending a spell slot. Once you cast the spell in this way, you can't do so again until you finish a long rest. You can also restore your use of the feature by expending four uses of your Bardic Inspiration. No action required. That's a lot of uses. That is. And Auto's Irresistible Dance, a perfectly fine spell. Absolutely. Very thematic. 14th yeah. level is a little high. but Yeah. I mean, the one the one use, love it. Probably yeah. not, I'm probably never, you know, if word I had to play this, would not use four Bardic yeah. Inspirations to do that particular spell. Yeah. Free spell casting is always good, though. Really? College of Dance, I think it's fun. It's like the main art form that wasn't represented yet, and now it is. Yeah, there we go. College of Glamour. Design note. This was originally printed in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Mantle of Inspiration now grants a number of temporary hit points determined by a roll of Bardic Inspiration. Beguiling Magic, formerly Enthralling Performance, has been redesigned to focus on enhancing your enchantment and illusion spells. Mantle of Majesty now ensures you have the command spell prepared, and you can restore your use of the feature by expending a spell slot of third level or higher. And then Unbreakable Majesty now triggers on a creature hitting you and can negate the hit. Guiling Magic, you always have Charm Person and Mirror Image prepared. In addition, immediately after you cast an enchantment or illusion spell, you can cause a creature you see within 60 feet of yourself to make a wisdom saving throw against your spell save DC. On a failed save, the target has the frightened or charmed condition, your choice for one minute. The target can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns once you use this benefit. Can't use it again until you finish a long rest. You can restore the use of this feature by using one of your bardic inspiration. Uh, third level, you also get Mantle of Inspiration. You can weave fey magic into a song or dance to fill others with vigor. As a bonus action, you can expend a use of your Bardic Inspiration, rolling a Bardic Inspiration die. When you do so, choose a number of other creatures within 60 feet of yourself, up to a number equal to your Charisma modifier, minimum of one. Each of them gains a number of temporary hit points equal to two times the number rolled on the Bardic Inspiration die, and each of them can use its reaction to move up to its speed without provoking opportunity attacks. Another fun way to use your Bardic Inspiration, get mm-hmm. a little bit of temp HP, a little bit of re- movement around without uh, without taking attacks. Yeah, the mantles, uh, you know, the classes that uh, the subclasses that have the mantles, always a lovely little uh, little big little yeah, buff, little buff that uh, we don't, you know, that regular spell casting never gets you. Mm-hmm. At sixth level, Mantle of Majesty, you have the command spell prepared as a bonus action. As a bonus action, you can cast command without expending a spell slot, and you take on an unearthly appearance for one minute or until your concentration ends. During this time, you can cast command as a bonus action without expending a spell slot. Repeated bonus action commands yeah. is something. <laughs> That sounds very powerful to me. Any creature charmed by you automatically fails its saving throw against the command you cast with this feature, synergizing with the beguiling magic and the charm person. I like this combination. 
right here. Mm-hmm. It seems very powerful. It really does. We'll have to see how it plays out. Yes. Uh, Unbreakable Majesty, you get this at 14th level. As a bonus action, you can assume a magically majestic presence for one minute or until you have the incapacitated condition for the duration. Whenever any creature hits you with an attack, roll for the first time on a turn. The attacker must succeed a charisma saving throw against your spell slave DC or the attack misses instead as the creature recoils from your majesty. (laughs) Once you assume this majestic presence, you can't do so again until you finish a short or long rest. That's hilarious. This is a fun. This is a fun 14th level feature. Uh, I I think that's actually a really good level for it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's basically kind of better. Sang- uh, it's kind of worse sanctuary in a way, but also kind of better. Yeah. Where you can still do things, but you're also going to get a lot of safety, mm-hmm. especially from things that try and hit you. Any of those low level creatures that do one attack per turn just to peck away at your, and that have really low uh, charisma scores. Yeah. You're going to be fine. Uh, the College of Lore now. This is an updated version of the College of Lore subclass as it was put in the last playtest that had the bard. Uh, these are the changes from that original form. Bonus proficiencies has gone back to allowing any skill to be chosen. Cutting words can once more reduce damage. The damage reduction was absent in the previous bard playtest because of the now removed healing option in the bardic inspiration. Magical discoveries, formerly called additional magical secrets, has returned and now allows you to replace one of the chosen spells each time you gain a bard level. And then peerless skill now benefits both ability checks and attack rolls, not just ability checks. Bonus proficiency, you gain three extra proficiencies at level three. At level three, you also get cutting words. Oh, man, this is that's a lot of reading. When, when a creature you see within 60 feet of you makes a damage roll or succeeds on an ability check or an attack roll, you can use your reaction to expend a bardic inspiration die, roll it, subtract the number from the number rolled from the creature's roll, reducing the damage or potentially turning the success into a failure. Sixth level, magical discoveries. You learn two spells of your choice. These spells can come from any of the lists. Uh, or any combination of lists. A spell you choose must be a cantrip or a spell for which you have spell slots, as shown on the bard table. You always have the chosen spells prepared, and whatever you gain in bard level, you can replace one of the spells with another spell that meets the requirements above. And lastly, peerless skill at 14th level when you make an ability check on our attack roll and fail, you can expend a use of your bardic inspiration die, roll the bardic inspiration die, and add the number rolled to the d20, potentially turning a failure into a success on a failure. The bardic inspiration is not expended. Magical Discoveries. I like it a little bit more than the Magical Secrets. A bit more flexible. You can pick from multiple lists. It mm-hmm. lets you pick cantrips as well. Yes. College Lore. Straight buffed. <laughs> it's pretty It's it's pretty cut and dry, honestly, the College of Lore. Cutting Words is still a really, really great um, ability just all the way through. And now that they have it back to being able to add it to the, or take it away from the damage you know, is just more flexibility. Yeah. And lastly, the College of Valor. This is from the original 2014 Player's Handbook. Martial training, formerly bonus proficiencies, now allows you to use a weapon. What is happening outside? I'm going to go look out the window real quick. Is there a car? Is there a car? Like, it's, I don't know if this is picking up on the mics. It sounds like there's a car, like, crashing into rocks. Oh, so a couple of our neighbors moved out recently and just left a bunch of stuff. Uh, Some guys pulled up with a metal grate trailer. Gotcha. And are just taking stuff. Hey, good for them, man. Yeah, good Good for for them. them. Get out of here. Be quiet. Martial training, formerly bonus proficiency, now, is allow- now allows you to use a weapon as a spellcasting focus to cast spells from your bard spell list, which was often requested. And then combat inspiration has two changes. One, the defense option is now triggered by being hit. And two, the offense option works with any attacks of any kind, not just weapon attacks. So it now boosts your spell attacks as well. Level three, you get the combat inspiration. Uh, when a creature is hit by an attack roll, you can use your reaction to roll a bardic inspiration die and add it to to uh, AC against the attack, potentially causing an attack to miss. And then offense, after a creature hits a target with an attack roll, you can roll the Bark Inspiration die and add the number to the attack's damage against the next target. Third level, you also get martial training, where you gain proficiency in martial weapons, armor training, and armor training with uh, medium armor and shields. In addition, you can use a simpler martial weapon as a spellcasting focus. At sixth level, you get a one level delayed extra attack from full uh, martial classes. And then at 14th level, you get battle magic after you cast a spell that has a cast in time of an action, you can make one attack with a weapon as a bonus action. Perfectly fine for a battle bard. Yeah. I mean, the College of Valor is not all that interesting when you compare it to some of the other 
uh, fighting bards that they've added in, even even to this dancing bar that they've added yeah. in. Um, but uh, it's fine. Nothing wrong with it. Um, if I'm doing a martial bard, uh, a gish, a gish, yeah, that's the card. That's the term. A spell casting and uh, a swords and sorcery. Sure. The gish. Sure. I'm going for a swords bard over a valor bard personally. Yeah. That might be a hot take. No, but... no, I like the swords bard a lot. I do too. All right. Any last thoughts on the bard? No, the bard is. Uh, I mean, we've we've seen the bard in previous installments. These uh, updated classes, uh, subclasses, aren't two extreme overhauls, mm-hmm. just slight buffs. Yep. I think the bard is in a really good spot right now. Mm-hmm. I, I would be I, if this were the incarnation of the bard, I'd be totally fine with it. I know a lot of people were complaining last time that they killed the bard, they destroyed the bard, the bard, they've the bard's reverted fine. It back. I think, yeah. I think that they've re-added back in all those flavor things that a lot of people enjoyed. And despite the fact that I think it's probably a bit underpowered, I think the College of Dance is pretty cool. Yeah. It's fun, different play style. And it's still not not necessarily the last edition of that. We'll see. We won't necessarily... They can still make some changes yeah. going forward. Yeah. Uh, all right. On to the Cleric. Design note updates for the Cleric. Divine Order, formerly Holy Order, has been moved from second level to first. The Thaumaturge option has been redesigned to include elements from the former Thaumaturge and Scholar options. Spellcasting has one noteworthy change. Spell preparation is no longer tied to the level of your spell slots. Uh, Channel Divinity has returned to second level and the number of uses has increased with your cleric level and isn't based on your proficiency bonus. In addition, you regain one use whenever you finish a short rest. The healing and damage of Divine Spark has also changed and Turn Undead now uses the incapacitated and frightened conditions. Finally, the multi-classing sidebar has a new rule for Channel Divinity. Cleric subclass levels now match the level progression of the 2014 Player's Handbook, except for the subclasses now starting at third level instead of first. Smite Undead now uses your Wisdom modifier rather than your Proficiency bonus. You can also it also is clarified that this damage doesn't end the turn effect on an Undead. Blessed Strikes now lets you choose Divine Strike or Potent Spellcasting. In 2014, a subclass gave you those features. In the playtest, you now get the choice and in, in your base class. Uh, Commune is a new 9th level feature. Improved Blessed Strikes is a new 14th level feature. Divine Intervention and Greater Divine Intervention have been redesigned to allow reliable results. This was also the most requested change for those features. And then Greater Divine Intervention has returned to 20th level, replacing the Epic Boon. All right. You know, I was going to suggest we start uh, We start only yep. touching on fewer things, but then they redesigned the entire cleric class. So, yes, I agree. Uh, Divine Order, you get it at first level. You can be a protector where you gain uh, martial weapon proficiency and heavy arming, armor training. Or you can be Thaumaturge where you get one extra cantrip from the divine spell list. In addition, uh, your mystical connection gives you a bonus to your religion checks equal to your wisdom modifier. I feel like that should just be like base cleric. But I mean, it, you know, fine. this basically takes what was previously in 2014, the two different paths you could go for first level on different subclasses and just put them into one where you get to choose. Yeah. It's fine. And now you can mix it with different subclasses. Yeah. To, you don't have good. to. You don't have to be a heavy forge master. Yes. Heavy armor forge master. Yeah. Spill casting unchanged. Channel divinity largely unchanged. You get it back on a short rest or a long rest, as previously noted. Uh, Divine Spark is the magic action. Roll a d8, add your wisdom. You either restore hit points to a creature equal to the total or force them to make a constitution saving throw and take necrotic or radiant damage equal to the total or half on a success if they make the save. And then, of course, you get the the die increases at various levels as well. And then Turn Undead, as you are all familiar with from the 2014. At third level, you get the subclass. At fourth level, you get an ASI feat or another feat of your choice. At fifth level, you get Smite Undead. You can cause your Turn Undead feature to smite the undying. Whenever you use Turn Undead, you can roll a number of d8s equal to your Wisdom modifier, minimum of one, and add the rolls together. Each Undead that fails its saving throw against the Turn Undead takes Radiant Damage equal to the rolls total. The damage doesn't end the turn effect. Sixth level, you get a subclass. Seventh level, you get Blessed Strikes. You can choose Divine Strike, which is the melee option where you add a d8 of Necrotic or Radiant damage when you hit with a weapon attack, or Potent Spellcasting where you add your Wisdom modifier to to the damage you deal with any divine cantrip Uh, you get either option from if you get either option from another source you can only have one you all you use only the option you chose for this feat that's poorly worded uh eighth level asi improvement or feat ninth level commune this is the new feature in the past you've reached the divine source of your power through prayer now you can also have brief conversations you always have the commune spell prepared 
This is a, a thing that I would just always give my players a yeah. game, especially if they were like, hey, this is a holy place for you. You can just do this. Yeah. I. Yeah. Commune, commune is uh, making a mechanic out of a uh, role playing. Yes. Thing, which, you know, for some people, they need that to even do the thing in the first place. Oh, yeah. That's fine. Tenth level, divine intervention. The new divine intervention, by the way, I'm a big fan of. You call on your deity or pantheon to intervene on your behalf as a magic action. You choose a divine spell of fifth level or lower that does not require a reaction to cast. As part of the same action, you cast that spell without expending a spell slot or needing material components. You then can't use this feature again until you finish a long rest. Spells that require one minute, ten minute, hour casting times, one action. Mm -hmm. No material components and no spell slots. Yeah, compared to the 2014 edition of Divine Intervention, which was uh, you implore your deity's aid to requires you to requires you to use your action, describe the assistance you seek and roll a percentile die. If you roll a number equal to or lower than your cleric level, your deity intervenes. The DM chooses the nature of the intervention. The effects of the cler the effects of cleric spells or cleric domain spells would be appropriate. Uh, if your deity intervenes, you can not use this feature again for seven days otherwise you can use it again after a long rest yep. this is this is modeled a little bit off of the wish spell which you will find they even model more uh, when we get to the greater divine intervention at level 20 having reliable spell casting and ignoring the expensive material components of resurrection spells uh like a, the major buff spells oh my gosh this is, this is an amazing feature. The mm -hmm. cleric got a massive buff with this one. And it's less ambiguous than the old Divine Intervention oh, yeah. is. Oh, yeah. At 12th level, you get an ASI. At 14th level, you get implu impr improved, improved. Improved. Improved Blessed Strikes. Uh, if you have Divine Strike, the extra damage of your Divine Strike increases to 2d8. And then Potent Spell Casting, when you cast a Divine Cantrip and deal damage to a creature with it, you can give vitality to yourself or another creature within 60 feet of yourself, granting a number of temporary hit points equal to twice your wisdom modifier. So it takes extra damage on your wisdom modifier, and then you you or another person gets twice your wisdom modifier in temp HP. A little bit weird, but I'm into it. 16th level ASI, 17th level subclass, 19th level ASI, and then at 20th level, you get the greater divine intervention. When you use your divine intervention feature, you can choose wish when you select a spell. If you do so, you can't use divine inter intervention again until you finish 2D four long rests when you cast wish with this feature you are immune to the stress caused by using wish to do something other than casting a spell you do not have to worry about losing wish you do not have to worry about any of the stressors or our downsides of using non-spell huh our live ended oh our live ended oh well <laughs> okay i'm gonna carry on fair enough rip why did that happen sorry quick sidebar it thinks we're live. I just, it just told me our live ended. That's rude. Uh, on my phone, it says that we're still live, so I'm just going to pretend like we are. But anyway, Wish, great feature, big fan. Um, being able to, you now the cleric can use this to cast any spell mm -hmm. <laughs> on any list once. Uh, 2d4 long rests. I think that's a fair downside, um, especially when you're just able to do whatever you want for free. Yeah, and picture. and and likely if you if you use this feature, you're probably not gonna you know there's probably gonna be a big magnum opus of a of yeah. a of an effect in a in a combat or whatever. So you're probably not gonna need it again for the the two d four days. Yeah, uh, four four domains are shown: life domain, light domain, trickery domain, and war domain. Uh, the main changes for the life domain, uh, this is from the last playtest version. Domain spells, once again, include first level spells and prayer of healing, has been replaced by aid. Uh, the aid spell, our friend Darren, very big fan of. Mm -hmm. He loves the aid spell. Uh, Disciple of life, now clearer that its extra hit points are based on the spell slot expended. Preserve life has been redesigned to give more flexibility in how you protect yourself and others. Healing spells are almost all abjuration spells now, so the revised feature applies to almost all defensive and healing spells on the divine list. Blessed Healer is now clearer that it 
its extra hit points are based on the spell slot expended. Divine Strike has been replaced by Blessed Strikes in the base class, and then Supreme Healing now applies to Channel Divinity as well as spells. Let's just go ahead and jump to Preserve Life. It's the third level spell. It seems to be the one with the most changes. As part of casting a prepared Abjuration spell from the Divine Spell list, you can expend a use of your Channel Divinity to create a spell slot to use for the casting. You must expend a number of Channel Divinity uses equal to the spell's level. For example, you can expend one use of the Channel Divinity to create a first level spell slot for casting Shield of Faith if you have that spell prepared. Interesting. Yep. I mean, it just more lateral moves to slightly different. Uh, yep. I still think the the chief thing to look for on these subclasses are the domain spells. Uh, the life the life domain has some very good uh, domain spells: mass healing word, revivify, cure wounds, bless, aid, lesser restoration, aura of life, death ward. Great. Like they're all of all of those spells are exceptionally good. They are. The Light Domain, main updates from the 2014 Player's Handbook. Bonus Cantrip has been replaced by Divine Order in the base class. Domain Spells contain several different spells, fleshing out the list with options that emphasize Revelation. Interesting. Warding Flare now has improved Flare rolled into it, allowing the cleric to use the feature on themselves and their allies. Revealing Light is a new 6th level feature. Potent Spellcasting has been replaced by Blessed Strikes in the base class, and Corona of Light now also benefits Radiance of the Dawn, and it no longer requires an action to deactivate early. Let's take a look at Revealing Light. It's the new 6th level feature. As a bonus action, you can present your holy symbol and cast Sea Invisibility without expending a spell slot. When you cast in this way, allies also gain the benefit of the spell while within 10 feet of you. Until the spell ends, you admit, emit bright light in a 10-foot radius and dim light for an additional 10 feet. You can end the spell early as a bonus action. Once you use this feature, you cannot do so again until you finish a long rest. Nothing too crazy here. It's a little niche. It's It's got some versatility, but I feel that the Sea Invisibility spell is one of those that um, doesn't get cast all that often. It's not really needed to. You're not really worrying about seeing invisible things most of the time. Yeah. Uh, the Trickery Domain... This is from the 2014 Player's Handbook. Domain spells have been updated. Blessing of the Trickster can now target someone up to 30 feet away, and clerics can use it on themselves as well. Invoke Duplicity no longer requires concentration, and it requires a bonus action rather than an action. In addition, you teleport when you first use it, not just when you move the illusion later. Trickster's Magic is a new feature that replaces Cloak of Shadows, which was poorly rated, and the domain spells now include invisibility, so it makes it a bit redundant. Uh, Divine Strike has been replaced by Blessed Strikes in the base class, and Improved Duplicity was poorly rated and now has entirely new functionality. So let's take a look at Trickster's Magic and Improved Duplicity. At 6th level, you get Trickster's Magic. If you cast a spell of the Illusion School using a spell slot, you can change the spell's casting time to a bonus action for this casting, provided the spell's casting time is normally an action. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your Wisdom modifier minimum once and regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. At 17th level, you get Improved Duplicity. The illusion of your invoked duplicity has grown more powerful when you create it. You can teleport up to 120 feet rather than 30, and when you move it, you can move it up to 60 feet rather than 30. In addition, when you and your allies make attack rolls against a creature within 5 feet of the illusion, the attack rolls have advantage. Finally, when the illusion ends, you or a creature of your choice within 5 feet of it regains a number of hit points equal to your cleric level. At 17th level, that is a minimum of 17. So previously, Cloak of Shadows with the 6th level feature was, as an action, you become invisible to the end of your next turn. Uh, that's not great. Um, single turn invisibility, no, it's, it seems like it could be, oh, I'll escape, I'll get out of there. Not really. Uh, and then improved duplicity formerly, uh, you create four duplicates in, uh, instead of one. Yeah. And as a bonus action, you can on your turn, you can move any number of them up to 30 feet to a maximum of 120 feet. That a little was, disappointing. Yeah. A little uh, lackluster. The, the new improved duplicity, I think, is much better. Also, I think I fixed the life. Did you? Lastly, the War Domain. This is from the original Player's Handbook in 2014. Bonus proficiencies has been replaced by Divine Order in the base class. Domain Spells includes Destructive Wave instead of Flame Strike. War Priest now lets you use the mastery property of a weapon, including the weapon masteries from a previous UA. In addition, the bonus attack recharges on a short rest, not just a long rest, and it doesn't have to be paired with the attack action anymore. 
Guided Strike now lets you benefit yourself or another creature, and, and it's triggered by missing, ensuring it has a greater chance of causing an attack to hit. War God's Blessing has been redesigned to allow a cleric to protect allies. The former functionality of this feature has been incorporated into Guided Strike. And then Divine Strike was replaced by Blessed Strikes in the base class. Avatar of Battle now provides resistance to all bludgeoning, piercing, slashing damage, not just non-magical versions. That was a dumb thing for them <laughs> to include in the first place. Uh, let's just quickly go over War God's Blessing as it was redesigned. Sixth level, you get War God's Blessing. Whenever you cast a Shield of Faith spell on another creature, the spell also affects you. In addition, you can cast the spell once without expending a spell slot. You regain the ability to do so on a short or long rest. Wanting you to cast a lot of Shields of Faith now. Yeah. Previously, it was literally the same as Guided Strike, except in Guided Strike was only on yourself. So now, War God, and got War God's Blessing was for other creatures. Yes. Uh, so to give new functionality and not just copy, paste, change one word, I'm, I'm a big fan of that. All right. That is it for the Cleric. Any final thoughts? Good job. Good job. Druid. I think we're all going to be much happier with the Druid now. We were we were not pleased with the wild shaping. The druid we said we we've been saying for years the druid is, is a little overpowered and that's often why you know I don't want to play it. And then uh, this and then one they chopped off its legs. They just yeah completely <laughs> uh, yeah. It's like wow this person is like one of the most elite like like. Uh, uh, barbell squatters in the world. Their legs are so massive and powerful. How do we make them more reasonable? All right, let's cut them off at the hips. Yeah. Well, now they're not good as good at sw- at squatting as like a toddler. What's happening? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Design note updates for the druid. Channel nature has been cut in favor of restoring wild shape at second level. Druidic, now also make sure you always have Speak with Animals prepared. Primal Order is a new first level feature which lets you improve your armor and weapon proficiencies or your spell casting. Wild Shape has returned to second level. The feature has returned to using beast stat blocks. Thank God. God. Uh, and has new rules for how you interact with those stat blocks. In addition, using Wild Shape is a bonus action for all druids and swim speeds are available from the beginning. Thank God. Yeah. Spell casting has one noteworthy change. Spell preparation is no longer tied to the level of your spell slots. Wild Resurgence has moved from 15th to 5th level and has been redesigned. The new feature answers the desire to have more flexibility between using Wild Shape and spells. Elemental Fury is a new 7th level feature, allowing the Druid to increase the effectiveness of their cantrips or their attacks with weapons in Wild Shape. Commune with Nature is a new 9th level feature. Improved Elemental Fury is a new 15th level feature, improving whatever option the druid chose for elemental fury and then arch druid now includes the ability to turn unexpected unexpended uses of wild shape into a spell slot it's also returned to 20th level replacing the epic boon feature all right quick one run th- quick one for uh, what do we hit the quitty what do we hit the quitty uh first level druidic speak with animals you also know druidic a secret language of druid blah 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 primal order you also get a first level you can choose the magician You know an extra cantrip from the primal spell list. In addition, your mystical connection to nature gives you a bonus to your nature checks equal to your wisdom modifier. And then Warden. Trained for battle, you gain martial weapon proficiency and medium armor training. Things the druid I don't think really ever got. No. Previous incarnations. No, they did not. Spellcasting, largely unchanged. Second level, Wild Companion. You can summon a nature spirit that assumes an animal form to aid you. As a magic action, you expend a use of your wild shape to cast the Find Familiar spell without material components. You can cast this When you cast a spell in this way, the familiar is a fey, and it disappears when you finish a long rest. So you have to cast it every day if you want. Second level, you get Wild Shape. It's a bonus action. You can transform into a beast. The, here's okay. We're just gonna. I'm just gonna. I'm not gonna read all this because this is a, it's a, a lot. Fucking lot. Here's the table. Druid level second. Known forms three. You have to pick specific forms to know. You don't just get to pick any list. The maximum CR for those stat blocks is a quarter. No fly speed. Fourth level, you know an additional form. The CR increases to one half. No fly speed. At eighth level, you know five forms. CR increases to one, and the fly speed you can now use. Uh, you get to use your wild shape twice, regain it on a short. Lo- uh, you regain one use on a short rest, and you regain all uses on a long rest. You gain additional uses when you reach certain levels. Here are the rules while transformed. Your game statistics are replaced by the statistics of the beast, but you retain your hit points, hit dice, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma scores, class features. Species traits, languages, and feats. 
You also retain your skill and saving throw proficiencies and use your proficiency bonus for them in addition to gaining those of the creature. You keep your proficiencies. You gain any proficiencies of the creature. Mm-hmm. You gain. You basically are gaining their strength, dexterity, and constitution. Uh, so you're going to be able to hit a bit harder. You keep your intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. You now no longer assume their hit points, which is a big debuff, but that was also kind of the thing that made Wild Shape way too powerful. Yeah, in a lot of cases, and uh, a little bit uh, uh, later on, they do, or in the, they take, in the Circle of Moon Druid, they buff that, which gives it the actual feeling of the Circle of Moon supposed to be that combat Wild Shape. Yes. As opposed to previously where it was. Uh, this, though, you know, you keep your hit points, so if you turn into a cat and then somebody kicks you, you don't lose. <laughs> yes, you get to stay, you stay as the animal now. You are the beefiest squirrel there ever is. Exactly, which I think is much better. Yes. Wimpy Bear, mind. beefy squirrel. Yes. That would be, that'd be fun. Um... Weak, weak bear, beefy squirrel. That's going to be the title of my biography. <laughs> Wimpy bear, weak, beefy squirrel. You still cannot cast spells while in wild shape, but your concentration does not break. This is the same as previous. Uh, you ca- your ability to handle objects is determined by the form's limbs rather than your own. In addition, you choose whether your equipment falls to the ground or merges with you. Uh, it's Talk with your DM about certain things. Always do that. Yeah. Always talk with your DM. I think this is a much, much, much better version of wild shape. All the way around compared to the previous play test compared to the 2014 player's handbook i think this is probably this i would be totally fine if this was the final version of wild shape yeah i like the known forms because it definitely like one cuts down on the amount of prep that the that you need to do it two cuts down on the amount of uh, waffling you need to do at the yep. time of choosing yep um, and you can replace them every long rest so it's not it's not that detrimental of what you choose yeah it, um, it makes it easier for people that are playing a druid for the first time to be like all right these are just the ones i know i don't have to worry about anything yep else. and i also think that it definitely gives a uh dms an opportunity to give special wild shapes as uh, uh, rewards, yes. quest rewards, yes. which I think is something awesome. Absolutely. Third level, you get your druid subclass. Uh, this choice uh, for this, it shows uh, Circle of the Land, Circle of the Moon, and Circle of the Sea. Uh, circle of the Stars as well, but it is basically just the use the Circle of the Stars from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Uh, fourth level, you get an ASI. Fifth level, you get Wild Resurgence. If you have no uses of Wild Shape left, you can give yourself one use by expanding a spell slot. No action required. You can do so once per turn. In addition, you can expend one use of Wild Shape. No action required to give yourself a first level spell slot. And you can't do so again until you finish a long rest. Totally fine. Yeah. I mean, I think it's very interesting that, uh, at least previously, again, we, they, we've, we've really pulled back the wild shape into a good spot i think yeah um but it's very interesting that they that the the first level spell swap is, is spell slot is the swap point yeah i think that's fine i think it's fine get more uses of it now that it's limited it's more reasonable to have more mm-hmm. uses of it uh sixth level you get your subclass feature seventh level you get elemental fury uh, potent spell casting you add your wisdom modifier to damage you deal with any primal cantrip and then primal strike you get one of these options. Once on each of your turns, when you hit a creature with an attack roll using a weapon or a beast forms attack in wild shape, you cause the target to take an additional 1d8 cold fire, lightning, or thunder damage. Uh, take primal strike if you are doing a, uh, what is it? Circle of the, oh gosh, circle of the moon druid. <laughs> The Build-A-Bear Workshop's Druid. Yep. Uh, eighth level, you get an ASI. Ninth level, you get Commune with Nature. You always have Commune with Nature prepared. Uh, tenth level, you get a subclass feature. Twelfth level, you get an ASI. Fourteenth level, you get a subclass feature. Fifteenth level, you get Improved Elemental Fury, the potent spell casting. Uh, you cast a Primal Cantrip with a range of 10 feet or greater. The range increases to 300 feet. Kind of uh, kind of underwhelming, but whatever. Uh, primal Strike, the extra damage goes to 2d8 instead of 1. Oh, that's much better. Sixteenth uh, level, ASI. Eighteenth level, Beast Spells. While in Wild Shape, you can cast spells except ones that have a material component with a cost specified 19th level you get an asi 20th level you get arch druid whenever you roll initiative and have no uses of your wild shape you're gaining use of your wild shape nature magician you can convert uses of wild shape into a spell slot no action required choose a number of your unexpended uses of wild shape and convert them into a single spell slot which each use contributing oh gosh with each use contributing two spell levels you must finish a long rest before you can do so again. For example, if you convert two uses of Wild Shape, you produce a fourth level spell slot. Longevity, your primal magic you wield, causes you to age more slowly for every 10 years that pass your body only ages one. 
this is a much better position for the druid to be in. Yes. Uh, they really reined back the that overpower. They reined back the 2014 version. They pushed up the original playtest version. And now it's one of those things that I, you know, again, a lot of hesitation on my part to play one of these because, again, it's just so overpowered in 2014. Yeah. This is a very happy medium, in my opinion. Notable change to the 20th level Archdruid feature. Uh, you do not get unlimited uh, wild shaping simply because of the sh wild shape spell slot. The spell slot interactions. Which I think is perfectly fine. That's fine. Circle of the Land. This was in the original 2014 Player's Handbook. Major updates include circle spells. Now let you pick a different land type each day. It, al it has also absorbed the old bonus cantrip feature. The spell lists are shorter than their 2014 equivalent since the druid can now change lists each day. Land's Aid is a new third level feature which lets the druid expend uses of wild shape to heal and harm in an area. Uh, Natural Recovery is now a sixth level, replacing Land Stride and enhances circle spells. Nature's Ward has been redesigned to be more useful and interact with circle spells. Nature's Sanctuary has been redesigned to give the druid another way to use wild shape to provide protection to the druid and allies. Let's take a look at land, what is it, land's aid. It's a new third level feature. Oh boy. Where is it? It's on the right below the spell lists. Really? Oh, okay, it was hidden. When you channel the power of the land itself to bolster your friends and harm foes as a magic action, you can expend a use of wild shape, choose a point within 60 feet of yourself. <sighs> 10-foot radius sphere centered on a point. Each creature of your choice must make a constitution saving throw, taking 2d10, 2d6 necrotic damage on a failed save or half as much as successful. In addition, one creature of your choice in that area regains 2d6 hit points. Uh, it increases to 3d6 for both at 10th level and 4d6 for both at 14th level. That is a fun feature. They I'm gave you they gave you Wither and Bloom, a version of Wither and Bloom. Pretty much. I'm into that. Yeah, it's a fun little thing. I like it. Uh, any any other things you want to talk about with the Circle of the Land Druid? No, the Circle of the Land Druid has never been all that interesting. I do like I do like that the the various land types. It's now just four: our arid land, polar land, temperate land, and tropical land, yeah. as opposed to like what was Yo. it eight? Yeah, <laughs> eight, or, yeah, eight, eight before. Uh, the, yeah, like they said, they really honed it in, and then letting you uh, switch yeah. every day. Uh, Circle of the Moon Druid has been updated from the latest playtest version. Uh, this is the fighting in wild shape one. Circle Forms has returned from the 2014 version of the subclass, as in that version, the feature improved at 6th level, now in a feature called Improved Circle Forms. Combat Wild Shape now, allows, now lets you use either your AC or the Beast Forms AC, whichever is higher. The feature also ensures you always have Moonbeam, Moonbeam, Moonboom uh, prepared, and you can cast that spell while in wild shape form. As in previous Druid playtests, the feature also lets you cast Abjuration spells while in wild shape form. Well, most healing spells now belong to the Abjuration school. They mm -hmm. want to make that note as well. That is a big buff for combat wild shape. Hey, yeah, it really is. The main thing was bonus action transforming, and now all Druids can do that. Yeah, and so it really gives you a... You, just use, using your action to do nothing, essentially, to prep... Yeah. Sucks in the middle of combat. So you also... You, it doesn't even mention this in the breakdown. You also get temporary HP. So yeah, instead of obtaining the wild shapes uh, HP, yeah. you get temporary hit points equal to its hit points or three times your druid level, whichever is lower. Yes, and you also get two new features at tenth at uh, tenth level. You get moonlight step, which allows the druid to teleport, and then at fourteenth level, you get lunar form, which enhances other features in the subclass. The big one here: combat wild shape. The AC you get to pick. Mm -hmm. Temporary hit points, as you previously described. Uh, abjuration spells. Being able to cast abjuration spells that do not have a material component with a cost or that consume its material component, to be fair. So you can't revive anybody while you're in wild shape. Can't revive anybody in wild shape, but healing spells, as well as there's some other niche abjuration protective things you can do, and then just being able to cast Moonbeam. All of that wrapped up in third level. Mm -hmm. That is very, very good. And... You also get the circle forms where your challenge rating for wild shape is one instead of one quarter at yeah. level three. This is a going to be a very powerful subclass. It does, it, you know, the old circle of the moon also gave you the elemental wild shapes at level 10 in which you could uh, expend two uses of wild shape to transform into an elemental. Uh, and then the 14th level was uh, you can cast alter self at will. I definitely think this, again, reigns in the power level of the Moon Druid, yeah. uh, getting rid of the elemental wild shapes. 
and then that alternate self is just kind of meh yeah it compared was a dead everything else it was a mostly dead feature uh speaking of those features though 10th level you get moonlight step now you can transport yourself as a bonus action teleporting up to 30 feet to an unoccupied space you have an advantage on the next attack roll you make before the end of your turn you can use this feature a number of times equal to your wisdom modifier you regain all expended uses on the wrong rest you can also regain uses by expending a spell slot of second level or higher for each use you want to restore at 14th level you get lunar form you get a movable moonbeam while your moonbeam is active you can move it up to 60 feet at the start of each of your turns no action required shared moonlight whenever you use moonlight step the teleportation you can also teleport one willing creature that creature must be within 10 feet of you and you teleport it to an unoccupied space you can see within 10 feet of your destination space this is a much better circle of the moon druid mm-hmm, i agree also we get the, the thematic nature of being able to cast moonbeam right yeah there was no it's like previously why is this the moon druid now it's yeah. like oh that makes sense why it's the moon druid yeah uh the last the last uh subclass that is presented is a brand new subclass uh, for the for this playtest and f- ever for the druid uh, circle of the sea so let's go over it all individually circle spells you get these spells they're always prepared third level fog cloud gust of wind ray of frost shatter thunder wave fifth level you get sleet storm f- and lightning bolt love the lightning bolt spell seventh level you get control water and ice storm at 19th level you get conjure elemental and hold monster third level feature wrath of the sea as a bonus action you can expend a use of your wild shape to manifest an aura that takes the form of an ocean spray that surrounds you the aura lasts for 10 minutes it ends early if you have the incapacitated condition you can dismiss it no action required or manifest the aura a second time at the end of each of your turns you can choose another creature you can see within 10 feet of yourself the target must succeed on a constitution saving throw against your spell save dc taking thunder damage and if the creature is large or smaller be pushed up to 15 feet away from you to determine this damage roll a number of d6s number of d6s equal to your wisdom modifier it's uh it's kind of reminiscent of the barbarians whatever the land barbarians one was yeah 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 yeah. Yeah. where you get that aura um, and auras are always good. You can never, you can never really doubt the effectiveness of an aura. Yes, and just, just a little bit of, just a little bit of passive extra damage on the end of each of your turns. You transform into a creature. You've got this up. You're running in. You're slashing. You're stabbing. You're biting. Whatever you're doing as your, as your wild shape form, and you're just getting a little bit of extra damage. Which, to be fair, to be fair, even a, even kind of like a lower statted druid is still probably going to have plus three of their wisdom. So that's three d six thunder damage. Which is pretty good. That's pretty good. Sixth level, you get Aquatic Affinity. You always have the Water Breathing spell prepared. In addition, you gain a Swim Speed equal to your regular speed. If you use Wild Shape to assume a form that lacks a Swim Speed, it now gains a Swim Speed. Little niche. That's fine. That's how the water things always are. Yeah. Tenth level, Stormborn. Wrath of the Sea confers two more benefits while active. You gain a Fly Speed equal to your speed, and you have resistance to Cold, Lightning, and Thunder damage. Love it. That is awesome. Uh, 14th level, you get Oceanic Gift. Whenever you use Wrath of the Sea, you can manifest the aura around one willing creature within 60 feet of you rather than manifesting it around yourself. The creature gains all the benefits of the aura and uses your spell save DC and wisdom modifier for it. In addition, you can manifest the aura around both the other creature and yourself if you expend two uses of Wild Shape instead of one when manifesting the aura. Slap this over your Raging Barbarian and they're going to have a real good time. Oh yeah, this is a fun, fun, chonky feature. Real, real good time. Love it. The the druid I think is in a much 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 better spot than it previously was. Yeah, they they reattached his legs. Mm-hmm. Yep, and now and now they're like reasonable human legs as opposed to freak uh, barbell squatting legs. Right. Yeah, and not regular barbell. I've got barbell squatting legs. I don't got freak barbell squatting legs. Nah, no, like no one's gonna mistake you for a Tour de France rider. No, 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 no. no. Or like, uh, um, uh, oh my gosh, what's his name? Thor, not 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 the character Thor. His name's literally Thor. Oh yeah 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 the uh, that guy. the lifter yeah. yeah 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 that guy that guy power lifter. Anyway, monk. This is the first time we have had the monk play test in one D and D. is very exciting. Design note: monk updates. This is from uh, the player. This is mostly inspired by the player's handbook survey in 2021. This has also been one of the classes that's been cooking at Wizards of the Coast for the longest time. Martial Arts starts with a D6 rather than a D4 for the Martial Arts die. The die applies only to unarmed strikes, not weapons. Weapons are now enhanced by weapon mastery. To keep up with other classes, the monk's unarmed strikes needed the damage boost, which goes up to a D12 rather than a D10 at the top end. 
Weapon Mastery is a new first level feature giving you new ways to use weapon. Martial Discipline, formerly Key, gives improved versions of Step of the Wind, which now lets you take both the disengage and dash, dash action at the same time. Deflect Missiles has been redesigned, making it easier to use in more situations and to deal more damage on average. Heightened Metabolism is a new 7th level feature, making it easier for the monk to regain discipline points, which are the new key points, and gain other benefits to of a short rest. Stunning Strike can now be used only once per turn, and the stun lasts until the start of your next turn. That is, a, I think, a reasonable change. <laughs> yeah, uh, if you were watching uh, uh, Campaign 2 of Critical Role, you definitely saw the... Pop, pop! You definitely saw the... Uh, the, the, <laughs> the I don't want to call it the abuse to use. The power. The, 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 the raw... Ab- the raw, like, oh, like, uh, fucking, ah, you know. The the ability is very powerful, ah. and it can get overwhelming to, uh, to very quickly. Oh, yeah. Uh, empowered Strikes, formerly Key Empowered Strikes, now let you deal force damage. Acrobatic Movement is the new name of Unarmored Movement. Self-Restoration replaces Stillness of Mind, Purity of Body, and Timeless Body, and it allows you to remove the conditions as a bonus action, not an action. Deflect Energy is a new 13th level feature, allowing you to use Deflect Missiles to deflect any type of ranged attack, including spell attacks. It replaces Tongue of the Sun and Moon, one of the lowest rated monk features. Uh, Disciplined Survivor was formerly called Diamond Soul. Uh, Superior Defense, formerly Empty Body, has been redesigned to not rely on spells. Perfect Discipline, formerly Perfect Self, has been moved from 20th level to 15th level, and Defy Death is a new 20th level feature. First level, martial arts, as you uh, largely largely the same with the damage die increase. Um, yeah. <laughs> when you use the attack action with an unarmed strike or a simple weapon, you can use you can make an uh, unarmed strike as a bonus action on the same turn. You can use dexterity instead of strength for unarmed strikes and simple weapons, except those that have the two-handed property. You get a D6 in place of the normal damage for your unarmed strike, and the die increases. Uh, first level, you also get Unarmored Defense, AC equals 10 plus Dexterity plus Wisdom. You also get Weapon Mastery. Your training with weapons allows you to use the mastery property of two kinds of simple weapons of your choice, such as daggers and spears. Uh, whenever you finish a long rest, you can change the kinds of simple weapons you choose. For example, you can switch to using the mastery property of maces and slings. Weapon Mastery, we're big fans of. Big fans of Weapon Mastery, and it makes sense for the monk, considering it is in the uh, warrior group, yep. and it's a physical or a martial class, and it is you're you're still being empowered to use uh, weapons, which I think is nice. Yes, other than like the Kensei monk, pretty much everyone was just pop pop with their fists. Yeah, they they, they really only made sense. Yeah. It'd be it would have been fun if they added uh, a special weapon mastery for unarmed strikes just for the monk. But I get it at the same time the weapon. Yeah, the yeah. I think that'd be fine, but. Yeah, to each their own. Maybe they'll add some. They, they have more design room now. Maybe they'll add some in a future yes. uh, update. Uh, replacing key points is martial discipline. Uh, you regain uh, discipline points on short rest or long rest. Um, or you regain... Let's see. Oh, my gosh. Short or long rest. Okay, well, that's really poorly worded. Uh, some of your martial discipline features require you to your target to make a saving throw. DC is eight plus proficiency plus wisdom. Uh, You get the normal ones you would expect. Flurry of blows immediately after you take the attack action on your turn, you can expend a discipline point to make two unarmed strikes as a bonus action. Patient defense, you expend a a discipline point to take the dodge action as a bonus action. And then step of the wind, you get disengage and dash as opposed to or dash as a bonus action. And your jump distance is doubled until the end of turn. You also at second level get unarmored movement Uh, Your speed increases by 10 feet when you aren't wearing armor or wielding a shield. And that increases throughout your class. Yes. Third level, you get your monk subclass as well as the deflect missiles. Excuse me. (laughs) It's it's been a week. (laughs) It's been a week. It's Wednesday. You can you can use your reaction to deflect ranged attacks against you that deal bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage. When you do so, the damage you take from the attack is reduced by 1d10 plus your dexterity modifier plus your monk level. That's a lot of damage reduction. If you reduce the damage to zero, you can expend a discipline point to redirect the attack towards the creature. 60 feet isn't behind total cover. Dexterity saving throw. Taking damage equal to two rolls of your martial arts die. The damage is the same in type as the attack. Uh, the subclasses that are present are... Uh, Warrior of Mercy, Warrior of Shadow, Warrior of the Four Elements, and Warrior of the Open Hand. Uh, For 
the playtest way of mercy is used for warrior of mercy from Tasha's quarter and everything so it's not actually present here fourth level you get an asi fourth level you also get slow fall you can use your reaction to reduce any fall damage by an amount equal to five times your monk level fifth level you get extra attack fifth level you also get stunning strike using a key point to attempt to stun the target they make a constitution saving throw and have the stun condition until the start of your next turn sixth level you get empowered strikes uh you deal you can choose to deal force damage or the normal type when you're using an unarmed strike uh, basically bypassing uh non-magical resistance mm -hmm. Sixth level subclass feature. Seventh level, you get evasion. Seventh level, you also get heightened metabolism. You can spend at least one minute resting. You can give yourself the benefits of a short rest. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. I think that is a very good feature. Yeah, nothing wrong with it. Eighth level ASI. Ninth level acrobatic movement. <sighs> Tenth level self-restoration. Through sheer force of will, you can use a bonus action to remove charmed, frightened, or poisoned from yourself. As an, in addition, foraging for food and drink doesn't give you level levels. Foregoing food and drink doesn't give you levels of exhaustion. Design note on disease. In the 2014, the Monk and the Paladin both gained immunity to disease. That immunity has been removed uh, because the word disease doesn't have a solid meaning in the rules. And for years, the rules have delivered disease-like effects through the poison condition. The game will continue to use the condition in that fashion. Yeah, there were a few different <laughs> things that were like diseases, and they were usually from monster bites or monsters like eggs in you yeah. um but other than that made no sense and uh so many times i wanted to use the disease feature could never find it because it didn't exist it didn't exist <laughs> exactly uh 11 level subclass feature 12th level asi 13th level deflect energy it's deflect missiles but on spell attacks uh 14th level disciplined survivor uh, proficiency in all saving throws you can use a discipline point to re-roll a saving throw as well 15th level perfect disciple you regain four expended discipline points if you have none when you roll initiative asi at 16 subclass 17 superior defense as a bonus action you can use three discipline points uh, to bolster yourself for one minute or until you're incapacitated gaining resistance to all damage except force 19th level you get ability score improvement and 20th level you get defy death if you drop to zero you can expend four discipline points roll four martial arts dice and add them together you regain a number of hit points instead Oh, gosh. Your number of hit points instead changes to the total rolled instead of zero. Basically, zero plus that. Yes. Uh, each time you use this feature after the first, the discipline point cost increases by two. When you finish a short or long rest, the discipline point resets to four. Yes. You can use it multiple times. You can. And you would technically be gaining more. Oh, no. You always roll four martial arts die. It just yes. Call. Okay, 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 okay. That's fair. Way of the Shadow. And, oh, sorry, do you have anything to say about that? I think that the whole monk class has been nicely redefined. Um, you know, we a lot of uh, min-maxers, a lot of uh, perfect build people uh, have often disliked the monk because uh, mm. it doesn't have as high as a power ceiling. Uh, it does have a higher... It has, it has a good floor, though, to it. Um, but now a lot of the features are just more succinct, make more sense, and are less kind of blah at a lot of levels. Yeah, I agree. Uh, let's talk about the Warrior of Shadow, formerly Way of the Shadow in the 2014 Player's Handbook. Shadow Arts has been redesigned, giving Monk Dark Vision a darkness spell that costs fewer discipline points than normal, and the darkness can be moved each turn during the duration of the spell. The monk can also see in their own darkness. Improved Shadow Step is a new feature that allows Shadow Step to be used in bright light as well. And then Cloak of Shadows has been moved to 17th level and redesigned to empower the monk while in dim light or darkness. It also gives you invisibility. Basically, now you can do all the darkness things. <laughs> yeah, without being as hindered as, uh, you know, the the magical darkness often requires you to be yeah. hindered. Yeah, totally fine. I liked the Way of Shadow Monk. I think the Warrior of Shadow is, is if you liked Way of Shadow, you'll like Warrior of Shadow. It's the same thing, but better. I really just like it for Shadow Step. Oh, yeah. Shadow Step is a really good ability. Uh, Warrior of the Elements, formerly Way of the Four Elements. This one has this one has probably had it's the lowest rated subclass in the entire player's handbook and has probably been redesigned the most. Uh, Disciple of the Elements has been replaced with new features gained at the levels a monk normally gains subclass features. Elemental Attunement is a new feature that enhances the monk's unarmed strike with elemental powers, replacing elemental discipline options like Fangs of the Fire Snake. Environmental Burst is a new feature that allows the monk to create a destructive 
a blast of destructive energy in an area, replacing elemental discipline options like Flame of the Phoenix. Stride of the Elements is a new feature that enhances the monk's step of the wind, and Elemental Epitome is the new feature that further enhances the monk with elemental power. So this is basically all brand new, so we're actually going to go through all of the features. Level 3, you get Elemental Attunement. You've attuned yourself to the elemental ways of the multiverse. You know the Elementalism cantrip. That is a new cantrip. Oh boy, gotta scroll, gotta scroll, gotta scroll. Sorry. You scroll, I'll talk. Uh, previously, the way of the four elements monk was pretty much just, hey, when you take this, when you get this subclass, uh, you, you know how you don't want to do sub spell casting, so you chose a monk? Well, instead, we'll give you a bunch of spell casting options and you spend monk points instead. Yes. All right, Elementalism is a transmutation cantrip on the Arcane and Primal spell list. It's cast time of an action, range of 30 feet, verbal, somatic, instantaneous. You exert control over the elements, creating one of the following effects. Uh, this is, for those of you who are curious, this is Monk Pressed Digitation. Monk's Digitation. Monk's Digitation. Uh, beckon Air, you create a breeze strong enough to ripple cloth, stir dust, rustle leaves, and close open doors and shutters, all in a five foot cube. Doors and shutters being held open by someone or something aren't affected. Beckon Earth, you create a thin shroud of dust or sand that covers surfaces in a five foot square uh, area, or you cause a single word to appear in your handwriting in a patch of dirt or sand. That one's cool. That's fun. Uh, beckon Fire, you create a thin cloud of harmless embers in colored scented smoke in a five foot area cube. You choose the color and scent, and the embers can light candles, torches, or lamps in that area. The smoke scent lingers for one minute. Beckon water. You can create a spray of cool mist that lightly dampens creatures and objects in the five-foot cube. Alternatively, you can create one cup of clean water, either in an open container or in or on a surface. The water evaporates in one minute. And then sculpt element. You cause dirt, sand, fire, smoke, mist, or water that can fit in a one-foot cube to assume a crude shape such as that of a creature or an object for one minute hour you can also make it look like a penis Fun suppose fact. you could yes you could indeed make it look like a penis which i feel like was the first thing that was going to happen anyway monk cantrips how do you feel about that uh it's it's an interesting choice they it seems like they designed the way of the four elements specifically to move away from like ooh spend key points to cast a spell and then here's the first thing you get is a spell, spell. which is just mechanizing a feature it's just fine i get it yeah it's it's moving a feature from this page to onto a, page. onto the back of the book yeah uh again this is the third level feature, Elemental Attunement, and you get the Elementalism Cantrip. In addition, at the start of your turn, you can spend a Discipline Point to imbue yourself with Elemental Energy. The energy lasts for 10 minutes or until you gain you are incapacity. You gain the following benefits. Elemental Strikes, whenever you hit with an unarmed strike, you can cause it to deal Acid, Cold, Fire, or Lightning damage instead. When you deal one of these types of damage with your unarmed strike, you can force the target to make a, sa a Strength saving throw on a failed save. You can move the target up to 10 feet toward or away from you as Elemental Energy swirls around it. Reach. When you make an unarmed strike, your reach is 10 feet greater than normal as elemental energy extends from you that is 15 foot punch reach that is a very cool third level feature it was uh again going back to the the mention of uh critical roles uh campaign two yeah. that was the that was the monk's uh special weapon she got yeah after after fighting some sort of demon i believe yep a a 15 foot reach lightning punch yeah now you can do that in acid cold fire or lightning punch Whatever flavor you prefer. I, I will choose the acid. Let's just hit him with LSD. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sixth level, you get elemental burst as a magic action. You can spend two discipline points to cause environmental energy to burst in a 20-foot radius sphere centered on a point within 120 feet of yourself, choosing acid, cold, fire, or lightning. Each creature in the sphere must make a dexterity saving throw. On a fail, they take damage of the chosen type equal to three rolls of your martial arts die. On a successful save, a creature takes half as much damage. Before or after you take this action, you can make one unarmed strike as a bonus action. L uh chill fireball for marshals yeah uh, 11th level stride of the elements when you use your step of the wind you gain fly and swim speed equal to your speed for 10 minutes 10 minute flight flying around for 10 minutes yeah, fuck it why not sure <laughs> one one key point to get 10 minutes of fly speed i think that is very good uh, 17th level elemental epitome Whenever you use the elemental attunement feature, you also gain the following benefits. You gain resistance to one of the following damage types, acid, cold, fire, or lightning. And at, at the start of each of your turns, you can change the choice. Destructive stride. When you use your step of the wind, your speed increases by 20 feet until the end of your turn. For that duration, any creature of your choice that takes damage... Any... For that... God, I cannot fucking talk when we do these fucking 1D&D playtests podcasts. <laughs> 
For that duration, any creature of your choice takes damage equal to one roll of your martial arts die when you enter a space within five feet of it. The damage is the same type you chose for this feature's damage resistance. A creature can take this damage only once per turn. And then Empowered Strikes. Once on each of your turns, you deal extra damage to a target equal to the to one roll of your martial arts die when you hit it with an unarmed strike. The damage is the same type you chose for this feature's damage res resistance. Basically giving you 2d whatever of your unarmed strike instead of 1d whatever of your unarmed strike. Mm -hmm. And that is the Warrior of the Elements. A much better subclass. It's much more playable. There's there's less waffling you have to do about these 15 choices you have. Um, all of and, which suck and all of which cost too much. Yeah, and these wrap nicely into the other monk abilities. Yes. Uh, Warrior of the Hand, formerly Way of the Open Hand from the original 2014 Player's Handbook. Uh, open Hand Technique requires a saving throw now for all three effects, not just two of them. Wholeness of Body now requires a bonus action rather than an action and can be used more than once per long rest, and its healing is tied to your Martial Arts die and your Wisdom. Fleet Step is a new 11th level feature that replaces Tranquility, one of the lowest rated monk features. And then Quivering Palm is no longer able to deal an uncapped amount of damage, reducing a creature with any number of hit points to zero, which was too powerful for the number of discipline points that it required. It now instead does 10d12 plus your monk level force damage. Or half if they make the save. That's still a lot of fucking damage. Yeah, previously it was 10d10 on a success. Otherwise it would just drop you to zero. Yeah. Now it's just 10d12 plus your monk level if you fail. Which will probably drop most things to zero. Which, to be fair, it's also the 17th level ability. Yeah, it is very powerful. And it's only three uh, dis uh, discipline points. Mm -hmm. It's very, very reasonable. Uh, you can only have one creature under the effect of this feature at a time as well. You can end the vibrations harmlessly. Uh, the new 11th level feature, Fleet Step, you can easily stride out of harm's way. When you use your Step of the Wind option, uh, you can use it without expending any uh, disciple points. As opposed to... Discipline points. Yeah, as opposed to at the beginning of your... Uh, Beginning at level 11th level, you can enter a special meditation that surrounds you with a aura of peace. At the end of a long rest, you Lame. gain the f effects of sanctuary spell that lasts until the start of your next long rest. Lame. The saving throw DC is a plus your wisdom modifier plus proficiency bonus. Yes, this is Lame. just... Yeah, the, the sanctuary, don't get me wrong. It's fine. Good spell. Decent spell. Really good for protection. Really good if you like don't want... Uh, but it's still very much niche compared to um, this. The, the fleet step yeah yeah it's a whole it's a whole thing i think this is a much better way of the open hand monk uh though i still don't think it's all that great of a subclass option i think it's the most monkey monk it is very it, yes it's very monk yeah um but you know it's a simple it's a simple class or subclass for for new people yeah I think it's perfectly fine. We don't want to worry about teleporting. That is the monk. What else you got to say? I like the monk. I've liked the monk. I liked the monk previously. I was a big monk. Monk stan. Mm -hmm. um, this I, seems I, just I as fun. As well. I, well. I don't know if it's a... Uh, if, you know... I think there's some lateral movements. I think there's some more room for improvement, but... Yeah. No, nothing wrong with it. I like, I like where the way of the four elements is at. Or, sorry. Warrior of the elements is at. Uh, warrior of the open hand probably could do a bit more. Mm-hmm. I think that's perfectly fine. On to the Paladin. We've got three more classes, guys. Bear with us, please. Paladin updates. Lay on hands is now a bonus action. Hallelujah! About fucking time. Uh, spell casting has three noteworthy changes. Spell preparation is no longer tied to the level of your spell slots. The Paladin can change one prepared spell upon finishing a long rest, and cantrips are no longer included. The Paladin instead gets weapon mastery at first level. Which I think is perfectly fine. Sure. Also, they get Weapon Master. They get Weapon Master. <laughs> Paladin Smite, formerly Divine Smite, now gives you a list of Paladin-exclusive Smite spells that you always have prepared. Channel Divinity is a new rule in the multi-classing sidebar. Uh, Paladin subclass levels now match the level progression of the 2014 Paladin subclasses, ensuring compatibility with subclasses already in print. Aura of Protection has returned to 6th level, and the aura is inactive if you are incapacitated. Abjure Foes now does nothing on a successful save. Aura of Courage has returned to 10th level. Radiant Strikes now work with melee weapons and unarmed strikes. 
Restoring Touch has moved to 14th level, and Divine Conduit has been removed in favor of Aura Expansion returning to 18th level. So they've reverted several things, but the main thing that I want to talk about, we're going we're gonna to look at Paladin Smite here. Mm-hmm. Paladin Smite you get at second level. You have mastered smiting your targets with divine energy. You always have certain spells ready. When you reach your paladin level specified in the smite spells table, you thereafter always have the listed spells prepared. In addition, you can cast one of your prepared spells with from this feature without expending a spell slot. You must first you must finish a long rest before you can use this benefit again. At second level, you get divine smite and thunder smite. Fifth level, you get shining smite. Ninth level, you get blinding smite. Thirteenth level, you get staggering smite. And seventeenth level, you get banishing smite divine smite is just the divine smite feature now as a spell Mm -hmm. as a smite spell and we're we're scrolling down to spells again which again as they've moved a lot of features into spells um especially in spell casting classes uh this only makes sense uh format wise yes divine smite First level evocation spell, Paladin exclusive. Oh, oh, pretty much all of the smite spells, except for I believe it was uh, Wrathful Smite and ooh, the one that deals fire damage. I think those two are on the divine list, but all of the other ones are Paladin exclusive now. Branding Smite? Branding Smite, that's the one. Uh, Divine Smite, first level evocation, Paladin exclusive, casting time bonus action, which you take immediately after hitting a target with a melee weapon or an unarmed strike. You can take the bonus action. Uh, It does require a bonus action now instead of just a free action, which kind of sucks, but you can take it after you hit. But it also, and again, also puts in line with the others that you wouldn't use because why would you spend the bonus action in addition to your spell slots? Yes. Uh, As you hit the target... Your strike glows with the divine power. The target takes an additional 2d8 radiant damage from the attack. The damage increases by 1d8 if the target is a fiend or an undead. When you cast this spell using a spell of second lot, second level or higher, damage increases by 1d8 for each slot level above first. Same progression as the divine smite feature. Now you just need a bonus action to do it. Some people aren't going to be happy about that. Yeah. I don't really care. Again, to be fair, it's, it's, fine. it's one of those that you have to weigh, you know, it's just another thing you have to weigh your options on. And I think a lot of a lot of the, as much as people are complaining about certain things like that, there's so much more that's getting put into like their reaction category yes. that allows you to do more with not just your turn but the combat in general. Yeah, on other people's turns. Uh, the other smite spell that you might not recognize, Shining Smite, is a second level transmutation spell. Bonus action, which you take immediately after hitting a creature with a melee weapon or an unarmed strike. As you hit the creature, your strike flares with divine light. The target takes uh, the target hit by the strike takes an extra 2d6 radiant damage from the attack. If the target has the invisible condition, that condition ends on it. In addition, until the spell ends, the target sheds bright light in a 5-foot radius. Attack rolls against it have advantage, and it can't benefit from the invisible condition, and the damage increases by 1d6 per level. Why would you cast Divine Smite when you could instead cast Shining Smite? You would cat. You would cast divine smite because you want a d8, not a d6. Yeah, and the, the damage is the damage is, in most cases, going to be exceptionally similar. Yes, and you're giving advantage for concentration up to a minute against a uh, against a single target. That is a very good smite spell. Yeah, I'm into it. All right, let's go back up to the paladin. Oh, oh gosh! Oh gosh! Oh gosh! <laughs> this PDF. My my computer is chugging with this PDF, my guy. It is rough. It is rough. We are also chugging with this PDF. Oh, I don't even know what that means. I, 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 you know what? I think we're, re- I think we're, 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 we're reaching the uh, slow descent into insanity portion of the podcast. Look, I'll just say that I'm glad they've returned the auras to this. That was a, always a big feature with the Paladin. And now that you have two base level auras um, yeah. again helpful yes second level you also get fighting style defense dueling great weapon fighting or protection you get channel divinity at third level you can use it twice short rest to regain one long rest to regain both uh, one of the options is divine sense bonus action detect awareness 10 minutes you guys know the whole thing third level paladin subclass we have the oath of devotion the oath of glory the oath of the ancients and the oath of vengeance paladin uh, subclass is described here Fourth level ASI, fifth level extra attack. Fifth level, you also get Faithful Steed. You always have the Find Steed spell prepared. You can cast it once without expending a spell slot. You gain the ability to do so after a long rest. 
I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. Sixth level, you get your aura of protection. Invisible aura extends 10 feet from you in every direction. The aura is inactive if you're incapacitated. You and allies gain a bonus to saving throws equal to your charisma modifier. If another paladin is present, a creature can benefit only from only one aura of protection at a time. Seventh level subclass, eighth level ASI, ninth level abjure foes, magic action, channel divinity, present your holy symbol, target a number of creatures equal to your charisma modifier within 60 feet. Each target must succeed a wisdom saving throw or have the dazed and frightened conditions for one minute or until it takes any damage. 10th level, you get Aura of Courage. You and allies are immune to the Frightened condition while you're in your Aura of Protection. If a Frightened ally enters the Aura, the condition has no effect on that ally while in the Aura. 11th level, Radiant Strikes. When you hit a target with an attack roll using a melee weapon or an unarmed strike, the target takes an additional 1d8 Radiant Damage. That is on every single attack. 12th level, ASI. 14th level, Restoring Touch. When you use Lay on Hands on a creature, you can remove one or more of the following conditions as well. Blinded, Charmed, Dazed, Deafened, Frightened, Paralyzed, or Stunned. You must expend five hit points from your healing pool of Lay on Hands to do so. 15th level, Subclass. 16th level, ASI. 18th level, Aura Expansion is now 30 feet instead of 10. 19th level, ASI. 20th level is Subclass Feature. The capstone for the Paladin has, has always been is now the subclass yes it is this ultra form indeed you get to Yu-Gi-Oh out you get to Yu-Gi-Oh out Yu-Gi-Oh Yu-Gi-Oh we are definitely descending into madness here oh yeah oh yeah Oath of Devotion Oath of Glory Oath of the Ancients Oath of Vengeance we're gonna start with the Oath of Devotion here Oath spells have been revised in the Oath of Devotion spell list. Smite spells were replaced since they're now in the Paladin Smite feature. Smite of Protection has moved to 15th level. In addition, it now works with all your Paladin Smite spells. It provides half cover to you and your allies in your Aura of Protection. And then Holy Nimbus now provides advantage on saving throws against effects from fiends and undead. Effectively the same. <laughs> Effectively the same. Slight buffs change in spell list and now you just have access to more spells so always good love love some more spells oath of glory main updates to the class since its release in tasha's cauldron of everything inspiring smite no longer requires a bonus action and now works with all the spells provided by the paladin smite feature peerless athletes now last for an hour rather than 10 minutes and then aura of alacrity enhances aura of protection which results in features range being greater than before all improvements as well. Strictly better. Oath of the Ancients from the 2014 Player's Handbook. Nature's Wrath can now restrain multiple creatures of the Paladin's choice within 15 feet instead of 10. Turn the Faithless has been replaced by Abjur Foes in the base class. Aura of Warding now enhances the Paladin's Aura of Protection, provides resistance to necrotic and radiant damage. Undying Sentinel now also heals you. Elder Champion is now a bonus action instead of an action, and it benefits all your spells, not just Paladin spells. You can y- also regain the use of it by expending a 5th level spell slot. Again, all buffs. Yeah. Let's see if the if the trend continues with the Oath of Vengeance, the last of the subclasses here. Revenge! <laughs> Oath Spells now has Compelled Duel instead of Hunter's Mark, as Hunter's Mark is a Ranger exclusive. Sad face. Vow of Enmity now allows you to move your vow to another creature if the previous creature was reduced to zero hit points before the duration of the feature ends and the feature's range has been increased. Relentless Avenger can now reduce the target's speed to zero. Abjur Enemy has been replaced by Abjur Foes in the base class and Avenging Angel now uses a bonus action instead of an action. You can u- regain it with a fifth level spell slot. All improved. The Paladin was another one that we were really worried about uh, in the last play test that I came out in. Uh, so to see that they've made some pretty significant changes back. Yeah. And that they've just taken these subclasses, which I would say that the Paladin subclasses seem to be some of the things that people love the most, especially mm-hmm. one in in RP and two in power building, uh, to see that they have just expanded those to be more helpful instead yeah. of instead of trying to rework everything. I would I would make one improvement here. I would I would like the free casting of the smite spells to not require a bonus action. Because there's some other features, particularly at 20th level, you have to use a bonus action to activate your fancy things. Uh, but there's other bonus action things to do, and I think it would be nice if that it, if just the free cast was if just no if just one just the one free one you get without a spell slot was just completely free. So that way it's like it's like I used my bonus action to do something, and now I hit. Oh my god, I crit, and now I can't smite. 
That's fair. I get that. Just, just the panic button hit on a crit. Also, uh, smite damage die should be doubled with uh, crits as well, because it wasn't in the last play test. Yes. Um, I, I, that's fine. That would be fine by me. Those, that, two, that, cha- those that was, two changes would make it perfect for me. I get the reason that they move the, div- the Divine Smite into the bonus action spot. Yes. Because otherwise, why would you take all those? And also... Well, you uh, could double smite. You could, but the uh, part of the problem was uh, with those other smites, they technically did require concentration because if you you would have to do the bonus action and then hit with it. Yes. So if you missed, you got to hold on to it. But that really limited what the paladin could do with other concentration spells. Yes. Uh, so I do like that change where now you take the bonus action after you successfully hit. I think that's good. Um, but now that Divine Smite is a spell, you can't Wrathful Smite. You can't hit and be like, bonus action, Wrathful Smite, and then pump a free Divine Smite into it as well. Like you could technically do if you prepped hit and then pumped an extra Divine Smite into it. But that's also a very niche case. I'm totally fine with that not being there. My boy, the Ranger. Ranger. The Ranger is back. Better than ever, baby. Design notes for the Rangers. Deft Explorer replaces the expertise feature at first level. Deft Explorer includes one expertise choice along with some terrain-oriented material, which playtesters requested. The feature now improves at ninth level as well. Spellcasting has three noteworthy changes. Spell preparation is no longer tied to the level of your spell slots. The ranger can now change prepared spells upon finishing a long rest, and cantrips are no longer included as the ranger gets weapon mastery. They also get weapon mastery at first level. <laughs> favorite, <laughs> I love that. I love that those two sentences are back to back. Right. Uh, favored enemy has moved to second level, and it no longer removes concentration from hunter's mark, which was overpowered in play tests. Hard disagree. Hard disagree. The feature instead now allows you to cast the spell a number of times without expending a spell slot. I think that's fine. Ranger subclass levels now match level progression in 2014, ensuring compatibility. Conjure Barrage is a new ninth level feature and is still also a spell. Don't worry. (laughs) Nature's Veil no longer uses spell slots and is moved to 14th level. Tireless now gives temporary hit points as an action, as in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Conjure is a new 17th level feature. Don't worry, it is also a spell still. Uh, Feral Senses has returned to 18th level, and then Foe Slayer is, a na- is now an improved version of the 2014 feature and has returned to 20th level, replacing the epic boon. We're just going to talk about a couple th- here. Deft Explorer. You are unsurpassed explorer. You can choose one of your proficiencies in a skill that appears on the ranger's list, and you gain expertise in that skill. In addition, you can choose two types of terrain, arctic, coast, desert, forest, grassland, mountain, swamp, or the underdark. You have advantage on nature checks about the chosen terrain, and you have advantage on survival checks to track creatures in them. Whenever you finish a long rest, you can meditate and replace one of the chosen terrain options with a different type. You don't have to be locked into one and then fuck up your entire campaign by picking the wrong terrain. Right. Spellcasting, we know what spellcasting does. Weapon Mastery at first level. If you like Weapon Mastery, check out our Weapon Mastery podcast. Cool stuff. When you finish a long rest, you can change the kinds of weapons uh, that you choose for your Weapon Mastery. Uh, Second level, Favored Enemy. You are adept at focusing on a single foe. You always have the Hunter's Mark spell prepared. You can cast it a number of times equal to your Wisdom modifier without expending a spell slot. You regain all expended uses of this feature when you finish a long rest. Second level, you get Fighting Style. Third level, you get your Ranger subclass. This one includes Beastmaster, Fey Wanderer, Gloomstalker, and Hunter. Uh, Fey Wanderer is just pulled from Tasha's Cold and everything. You can find it there. Fourth level ASI. Fifth level extra attack. Sixth level roving. Your speed increases by 10. When you aren't wearing heavy armor, you also have climb and swim speed equal to your speed. Seventh level subclass. Eighth level ASI. Ninth level conjure barrage. You always have conjure barrage prepared. Ninth level deft explorer improvement. Choose one of your proficiencies in a skill that appears on the ranger spell list. You gain expertise in that skill. So basically you're just getting expertise but delayed. It makes sense. It's an expert class. <laughs> yeah. In addition, choose two or more terrain types for your deft explorer. Two more terrain t- for four total. Yeah, four bas- total. Basically, a four of the six. I think they offered yeah. six or seven. Tenth level tireless. Oh man. You get the following benefits. Temporary HP as an action. You give yourself a number of temporary hit points equal to 1d8 plus your wisdom modifier. You can use this action a number of times equal to your wisdom modifier. You regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest and then decreases exhaustion. Whenever you finish a short rest, your exhaustion level, if any, decreases by one. 11th level subclass, 12th level ASI, 14th level nature's veil, bonus action to turn yourself invisible, number of times equal to your wisdom, expended, you get a bonus on a long rest. Get it back on a long rest. 15th level subclass, 16th level ASI, 17th level Conjure Volley. You always have Conjure Volley spell prepared. 18th level Feral Senses, uh, your connection to the forces of nature grants you blind sight with a range of 30 feet. That one is, that one's good. Uh, 19th level 
ASI. 20th level, Foe Slayer. You are an unparalleled hunter. When an attack roll misses the target of your hunter's mark, you can add your wisdom modifier to the attack roll, potentially turning it into a hit. In addition, when you hit, whenever you hit a target with an attack roll and deal damage to it, you can add your wisdom modifier to the damage. A little, little weak for 20th level feature, but still slightly better than it was previously. It could, yeah, that could easily be dropped down a couple levels and still and be better. Maybe even, yeah. yeah, like 14th level could be there. Yeah. I am much happier with this version of the Ranger than the last playtest. It feels more Ranger. That's fair. I mean, as we've said, the Hunter Ranger from 2014 could just be the Ranger, and that would be yeah. better. Well, the Hunter Ranger is, in my opinion, one of the better Ranger subclasses. It's a sleeper hit. Highly recommend. Well, that's what I'm saying. We could have yeah. those should just be the features, and then yeah. they should have a subclass on top of that. That would be that would be really cool. I think that would be really cool. But I'm still fine with this version of the Ranger, the Beastmaster. Notable changes. Primal Companion returns from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, which was a very well received feature. Exceptional Training now allows you to command your beast to use its bonus action to take the dash, disengage, dodge, or help action, and the beast's attacks. I almost said actions. The beast's attacks ignore damage resistance. And then Bestial Fury now allows your beast to benefit from your Hunter's Mark spell as well. Uh, you still get the predetermined Beast of the Sea, Beast of the Land, Beast of the Sky. The stat blocks are pretty much unchanged. Um, maybe a little bit better. Nothing crazy. Um, we did, we weren't very high on the, on the predetermined stat blocks, I don't think. Uh, for the Beastmaster, I don't. Uh, I don't mind it. I think that I there mind. should be some yeah. more options in there yeah. in these predetermined. But that being said, I like the concept. Yeah, yeah. Uh, bonus action to command. You can also let them take dash, disengage, bonus, and help as a, a bonus action. All good. Uh, Bestial Fury. All good. <laughs> command your beast. Ta beast takes two attacks. It's extra attack for your beast, um, and it gets Hunter's Mark extra damage as well. Share spells. When you cast a spell targeting yourself, you can also affect your primal companion beast if it is within 30 feet of you. A slightly better and a slightly simpler Beastmaster Ranger. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that. The Beastmaster has always been one of those. It's been redesigned so many times. Yeah. And I'm sure that it will continue to see redesigns not only from Wizards of the Coast, but also from uh, every homebrewer out there. I really think that a dedicated, important animal companion to build an entire subclass around i don't i don't think that works yeah which is a shame because i mean that's like an iconic ranger thing is to sure. have an animal companion um i if if then this would be great call me crazy primal companion as just a base ranger feature and then you get your beast of the sea beast of the sky beast of the land and you can change it I think that would be fine. And then you don't need to... F you could floof it up if you want, but... I don't know. I just don't think there's really a great way to do a Beastmaster. Which kind of sucks. I, I mean... Yeah. Again, like, like I said, there's been so many redesigns. And it always feels underpowered until it doesn't feel underpowered. In which case... Uh, I mean, we look back... Referencing Critical Role, once again, watching Campaign 1. At the end, the Beastmaster's uh, bear was basically just... Go give the barbarian one turn of uh, of flank, and, and then and then go into a jewel so you're protected and don't die. <laughs> Pokeball return. Yeah, Gloomstalker originally presented in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Here's the Ranger updates. Dread Ambusher now allows the Ranger to deal extra damage more often than only during the first round of combat, and includes the frightened condition. Umbral Sight now increases your dark vision by 60 feet instead of 30 if you already have sight, uh, dark vision. Uh, Stalker's Fury has been redesigned to enhance the frightened effect granted by Dread Ambusher. And then Shadowy Dodge now allows you to teleport immediately after the attack misses and the feature even works against an attack that has advantage. Why, oh why, did they buff the Gloomstalker? No one will really know. It was one of the most popular subclasses and is very powerful. Yeah. But that I'm, being said, I'm fine with them. Sure. Fine with a little, little buffy buff. Extra extra frightened condition. Also, uh, once per turn when you attack, it, deal, it deals an extra 1d8 psychic damage to the target. And then it forces the save for the frightened condition on it. Um, you just get that every turn. It's using your cool thing, man. Just every turn. I think that's awesome. That's what I'm, you know, again, that's what I'm here for is updates that let you move, use your cool thing more. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Love it. 
My boy, the hunter, though. I have a hunter ranger. You do have a hunter ranger. My work game. I'm a big fan of Illivar. Illy Vanillivar, as I've been calling him lately. Sure. <laughs> hunter updates. Hunter's Prey now contains the three feature options that appeared in 2014. Giant Killer has been renamed to... Retaliator. Retaliate. I, thank you. <laughs> to retaliate. I almost said... Real, real I, almost, I almost said retaliatator. Retaliatator. <laughs> retaliator. And now works against attackers of any size. Okay. A buff. Hunter's lore has moved from sixth level to third. Defensive tactics returns, but contains evasion and uncanny dodge from superior Hunter's defense. It also includes a new option, Hunter's Leap. Feedback on the 2014 Hunter strongly preferred the options in superior Hunter's defense over the ones in defensive tactics. Superior's Hunter... Superior Superior Hunter's Prey replaces multi-attack and lets you choose another option from Hunter's Prey. Superior Hunter's Defense now lets you choose another option from Defensive Tactics. Remove multi-attack, remove Superior Hunter's Defense, and then just give you a second a second option from the things that were kind of better. Yeah. <laughs> All good things. Um, Retaliator is the new one. <laughs> Immediately after a cr- Retaliator... <laughs> For fuck's sake, man. (laughs) Retaliator. Immediately after a creature within five feet of you attacks you, you can use your reaction to make one attack with a weapon against that creature, whether or not it hit you. I think that is a perfectly fine option. I do, too. Do we get to choose? Do we get to change the choices? You do not get to change the choices on a long rest. That would be even cooler, but you can't. I'm personally a fan of Horde Breaker. More so. Being able to make an an additional attack against a different thing. A Hunter's Lore... Is now at third level. While a creature is marked by your hunter's mark, you know whether that creature has any damage or condition immunities, resistances, damage vulnerabilities, and if the creature if the creature has any, you know exactly what they are. The cat is starting to be annoying. A nuisance. Yes. Evasion. Hunter's leap. If an enemy you can see enters a space within five feet of you, you can use your reaction to move up to half your speed without provoking opportunity attacks. If somebody comes near you, wah! Yeah. I still think evasion and uncanny dodge are going to be a bit better. Uh, but superior That's hunter, fair. superior hunter's prey, you just get an additional hunter's prey, and then superior hunter's defense, you just get another defensive tactic. Kind of a little bit of a cop out for 14, for eleventh and fifteenth level, but you get the better options. That's true. So and I'm, they said people liked them, so I get it. I'm into it. That is the ranger. I think the ranger is finally in a good spot too. I would have I would have liked a concentration free hunter's mark. There's some really good concentration spells that the ranger can cast that I would like to be able to cast and have Hunter's Mark up, but yeah. Yeah. beggars can't be choosers. At long last, we finally come to the rogue. This, I think, makes the rogue a lot more dynamic and fun, mm-hmm. the changes here. It's very a very interesting way to interact with sneak attack with features later on. We'll get into that. But Rogue was another one that a lot of people were upset about a very few changes that they yeah. did. So let's see if they've won over the people. They haven't. They won over still. me. You're not the people, though. I like I like this one. Sneak attack. Here are the updates. Sneak attack no longer is no longer required to be used on your turn with the attack action. That was the big one that people <laughs> did not like. They did that not like that it one. could not be used uh, and on opportunity yeah. attacks. Yes, absolutely. That was like the key. That was like the thing. Yeah. The thing. Uh, there were also some feats that let you make a reaction-based attack when they entered. Mm-hmm. All that kind of stuff. A few other things like that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Weapon Mastery, new first level feature. We love Weapon Mastery. Glad it's on the Rogue. Rogue subclass levels levels now match 2014 Rogue, so it's all consistent. Steady Aim, a new third level feature imported from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. It's a new use for your cunning action where you don't move and you get advantage. Mm -hmm. Consistent advantage for a Rogue is exactly what you need. Cunning Strikes is a new fifth level feature giving tactical options to sneak attack. I am a big fan of it. Expertise has returned to 6th level. Evasion has returned to 7th level. Reliable talent moved from 11th to 7th. Subtle Strikes has been removed because of the addition of Steady Aim. Improved Cunning Strike is a new 11th level feature. Devious Strikes is a new 14th level feature, which builds on the Cunning Strike. Elusive has returned to 18th level. Stroke of Luck has returned to 20th level, replacing Epic Boons. A lot of things have moved back to where they were. Yes. First level, you get Expertise. First level, you also get Sneak Attack. To get sneak attack, you have to have advantage. You have to have an ally adjacent to a target. One of those two options. You also get Thieves Cant and Weapon Mastery. A lot of of shit at level one. Love love a little bit of shit at level one. Weapon Mastery, you get to choose two. For example, daggers or short bows. You can change it on a long rest. Second level, you get Cunning Action. As a bonus action, you can dash, disengage, or hide. Third level, Rogue Subclass. 
Third level, you also get Steady Aim. As a bonus action, you can give yourself advantage on your next attack roll in, on the current turn. You can use this feature only if you haven't moved, and after you use it, your speed is zero until the end of the current turn. Fourth level, ASI. Fifth level, Cunning Strike. I'm very excited for this feature. When you deal sneak attack damage, you can add one of the following Cunning sh Strike effects. Each effect has a die cost, which is the number of sneak attack damage dice you are you must forego to add the effect. You remove the die before rolling and the effect occurs immediately after the attack's damage is dealt. For example, if you add the poison effect, remove a D6 from the sneak attack's damage dice before rolling. If a cunning strike effect requires a saving throw, the DC is eight plus proficiency plus dexterity. Disarm, cost one D6. The target must succeed a dexterity saving throw or drop one item that is holding. Poison, cost one D6. You add a toxin to your strike, forcing the target to make a constitution saving throw. On a failed save, the target has the poison condition for one minute. At the end of each of its turns, it can repeat the save, ending it on a success. To use this effect, you must have a poisoner's kit on your person. Trip. Cost. 1d6. If the target is large or smaller, you must succeed a dexterity saving throw or fall prone. And then withdraw. 1d6. Immediately after the attack, move up to half your speed without provoking opportunity attacks. Dynamic combat options and also a use for the poisoner's kit that isn't overly complicated yep love it but that's yeah that's definitely Big fucking fan here. one of those things where it's like oh boy the the rogue was very monochromatic we'll yes. call it or monotoned where it's like all right i'm gonna i'm either gonna run up and stab him or i'm gonna stay back here and shoot him yes. and then uh and then that's what i do and i hide but now you got a little bit of you got a little bit of versatility you got a little bit of uh tactical awareness now yes. an important note your sneak attack damage at this point when you get this feature at level five is 3d6 so you would still be doing 2d6 of extra damage mm -hmm. which is a very good spot to be in fifth level you also get uncanny dodge same as before sixth level you get expertise again same as before. Seventh level, you get evasion. Same as before. Seventh level, you also get reliable talent. Same as before. <laughs> Eighth level, you get an ASI. Se ninth level, you get a subclass feature. Tenth ASI. Eleventh level, improved cunning strike. You can use up to two cunning strike effects when you deal sneak attack damage, paying the die cost for both. Important note, at eleventh level, your sneak attack damage is 66. So you, if you use two, you would still be dealing 4d6 extra damage. That's pretty good. I like it. You can mix and match. The options aren't super crazy right now, but... We need to but. 14th level. <laughs> oh. 12th level ASI, 13th level subclass, 14th level Devious Strike. The following effects are now among your Cunning Strike options. Days, the cost is 2d6. The target must succeed on a constitution saving throw or it has the dazed condition until the end of its next turn. The end of its next turn. Mm -hmm. Dazed condition, as we have talked previously. Very good. Oh, it's a it's a great one. Very great condition for other people. Yeah, for no, you, you don't want it. No, you're not someone. Not not something here. Great condition. Knockout cost is six d six. The target must succeed on a Constitution saving throw, or it has the unconscious condition for one minute or until it takes any damage. The unconscious target can repeat the save at the end of each of its turns, ending the effect on itself on a success. Probably not going to use that one very much, but. S what they're doing is they're definitely mechanizing that uh, idea of I walk up behind him and I conk him. Conk him. Yep. Um, which is something that a lot of DMs just let players do anyway, especially yeah. the rogues. Of, yeah. Yeah. Totally fine. Constitution saving throw. There's some things that are going to resist that quite a bit. But being hit, be, having the chance to knock something, like f knock a fucking Baylor out. <laughs> just, because just because that's a un bad roll. Just unconscious on the ground. It's hilarious to me. <laughs> And then finally, you get Obscure. The cost is 3d6. You strike near the target's eyes. The target must succeed a dexterity saving throw or it has the blinded condition until the end of its next turn. Probably a bit overpriced for blinded condition. I would reduce the cost on that a little bit. But Yeah, when when dazed is 2d6 and blind is 3d6. They should both be 2d6 in my mind. Yeah, I agree. Knockout being 6d6 is fine. And then having these in addition to the other options and being able to pick any two you want, I think is really a mm -hmm. cool spot to be in. 15th level, Slippery Mind, same as before. 16th level, ASI, 17th level, Subclass, 18th level, Elusive, 19th level, Ability Score Improvement, 20th level, Stroke of Luck. I think the Cunning Strikes are fucking awesome i really like that they it's so it's like mini battle master for the rogue that yeah. all rogues have 
so cool, very flavorful, a lot of combat. And again, opens up new things for them to play with, Mm -hmm. new design space when it comes to subclasses. Oh my gosh, adding adding new cunning strike options Mm -hmm. for subclasses is going to be a thing. New cunning strike options for homebrew and magic items. Oh yeah. The... I love when they open a design door. That's so fun. We've got subclasses. Arcane Trickster, Assassin, Swashbuckler, and Thief subclasses. Arcane Trickster. Spellcasting now uses the arcane spell list rather than the wizard list. There is no school of magic restriction after third level. Moreover, the rogue can now change one cantrip when gaining a level and the rogue can use an arcane focus. Versatile Trickster has been redesigned to allow you to use certain options of your cunning strike with your mage hand. The ability to give yourself advantage now resides in steady aim. Effectively the same, but just a little bit simpler, a little bit better to use in the spellcasting department. Love these little one-third casters. I wish we could see what the Eldritch Knight would look like right now. But we can't. We, we will probably see it soon, though. Yes. Other than that, it is a, pretty much the exact same subclass. One that went through one of the bigger changes here, the Assassin. Assassinate now gives you advantage on initiative rolls, and the extra damage to the feature no longer requires the target to be surprised. It just has to be the first round of combat. So you don't need to, like, get the jump on them. Yeah, that was always a that was always a big issue with the Assassinate ability. Yeah. And a very powerful ability. It is. Infiltration Expertise combines Infiltration expertise and imposter from the 2014 version just two features in one now and venom weapons is a new 13th level feature allowing you to benefit from your poisoner's kit congratulations more mm-hmm. poisoner kit there you go synergies death strike no longer requires the target to be surprised it instead relies on your sneak attack assassinate again <laughs> the same it just is easier to hit Infiltration expertise combined two things, all good. And Venom weapons. When you use the poison option of your cunning strike, again, poison is 1d6 in cost. Mm -hmm. And it gives the poisoned condition if it fails the save. The target also will take 2d6 poison damage whenever it fails the saving throw. This damage ignores resistance to poison damage. So if they fail the save... You are not actually paying any cost. No, you're you're gaining. You're gaining an additional, a, a net gain of 1d6 damage that can't be resisted. Yeah. And the poison condition. Now, poison is one of the highest immunities yes. among creatures. But that being said, uh, you're pretty much taking this option every time. Oh, oh my gosh, yes. Oh my gosh, yes. And then, of course, death strike. The assassin, much better spot. Yeah, the assassin was always the big issue is it what was you kind of do your first round thing if you get access you know to this like you're saying surprise condition on the opponent um now there's still a lot of you you better do your big stuff right out front but now you have a little more uh, a little more zhuzh more zaza a little know? more zest a little we're definitely losing it. Let's let's go on to the swashbuckler. We got two more subclasses, guys. I'm sorry. Swashbuckler. This is from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Panache has been redesigned to apply its effects through the Cunning Strike feature. Dashing strikes replace elegant maneuver at 13th level and give you additional Cunning Strike options. Isn't that crazy? Wow. Who said that literally five minutes ago? Not even. <laughs> Master Duelist has been redesigned to allow you to make an additional attack provided you meet the requirements. Level three, you get fancy footwork. You get wreckish audacity those are unchanged level nine you get panache you get two new cunning strike options goad which is 1d6 in cost the target must succeed a wisdom saving throw or until the end of its next turn the target has disadvantage on attack rolls made against anyone other than you and cannot make opportunity attacks against targets other than you you also get awe which costs 3d6 Each creature of your choice within 30 feet must succeed on a wisdom saving throw or have the charmed condition until the end of your next turn. 13th level, the dashing strikes. Two more options. Parrying stance. Cost is 2d6. Roll a d6. Until the start of your next turn, you gain a bonus to your AC equal to the number rolled. And then invigorate. Cost 2d6. Choose a creature you can see within 30 feet of yourself until the end of that creature's next turn, which whenever it makes an attack roll or a saving throw, you can roll a d6 and add the number rolled to the attack roll or saving throw. And then Master Duelist, immediately after you use your sneak attack, you can make another attack against the same target provided you are within against 
What? It's the same target? What? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Immediately after you use your sneak attack, you can make another attack against the same target provided you are within five feet of it and no other creature. Okay. So you can't, like, shoot with a hand crossbow. Yeah. Okay, fair, 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 fair. This is a much better swashbuckler. I mean, the slot, the, the the swashbuckler, the swashbuckler, swashbuckler. Uh, Swash. honestly, is is a is a fun is a fun rogue, and one of the few like very thematically pirate. Oh yeah. Um, subclasses throughout uh, the entirety of of you know, all of D and D. All of D and D. Um, and also the fact that uh, the fancy footwork, um, or no, it's the racket audacity, I believe. Yes. No, the panache. That's the ninth level one. The one that gives you... Uh, you learn how to... Uh, We're dying here, guys. We're dying. I thought that the uh, the swashbuckler rogue, their additional way to gain sneak attack was to be a one-on-one with a person. Is that the... Um, did they remove was that? Yes, that's Rackus Audacity. You gain an additional way to use your sneak attack. You don't need advantage. That's what it is. Uh, if you're within five feet of it and no one else is, yes, that Rackus Audacity, yeah, uh, is one of the like best ways to, for a rogue to get uh, their sneak attack, at least in melee. At least in melee, but now with steady aim, true, a little redundant, but you get range. I, I think great. This is all great. I love the Swash Rockler. Finally, the thief, the last thing. I'm not, we're not, I'm not going over the fucking spells. We already went over the spells. Whatever. The thief, <laughs> design updates. Fast hands now lets you use, take the use an object action instead of the search action. It also lets you use the magic action to activate magic items. All as a bonus action. Second story work now lets you move along ceilings without an ability <laughs> check. All right. And it causes you to use your dexterity, not strength for jumping. Supreme Sneak has new functionality. You can sacrifice a sneak attack die to remain hidden when you attack. And then Thieves Reflexes has been restored to its former 2014 functionality. Fast Hands, you can do a sleight of hand to lock or disarm a trap. To pick a lock or disarm a trap with Thieves Tools as a bonus action, you can now use an object or... Uh, use a magic item as a bonus action second story work you gain climbing speed uh, you get the jumping with dexterity instead you can climb across the fucking ceiling uh, <laughs> ninth level supreme sneak stealth attack is a new cunning strike option cost is a 1d6 if you have the hide actions invisible condition this this attack doesn't end that condition on you if you end the turn behind three quarters cover or total cover basically keep you stay hidden yeah which is often a problem with rogues yep big attack ah crap yep 13th level use magic device same as before 17th level thieves reflexes same as before all right so love the thief that the the thief uh, i you know it's one of those that i i always look at in the 2014 and i'm like man that's just not worth playing yeah uh this still maybe not my first choice yeah but that being said, it now has a contender if, if you know, we're doing an all rogues party. Yep. Yeah. All right. We've been going for two hours and 15 minutes. You have 15 minutes for questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and or ideas in the TikTok live chat. We did have a little bit of a hiccup with the TikTok live earlier, but this is the chat from people currently in the TikTok live. Uh, we go live to record this podcast every other week, usually on Tuesdays. Today, we did it on Wednesday because of the holiday and because my PC blew up. You can find this podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube, U- YouTube Music Now, as well as YouTube Regular. Uh, this episode might not have an image up on the YouTube Regular. Again, my PC blew up. I am sorry. I am sorry that storms have ruined me. And then sponsored our podcast. Yes. Uh, all right. You can also join our Discord. Check out the Amazon affiliate links. All the links in the bio. All that kind of stuff. Whatever. Sam, what we got right. for the TikTok? Uh, uh, you want to do a little rapid fire? Yes. All right. Uh, is the Elder Knight in a good spot? I don't know. Doesn't exist yet. Not in one D&D. Friend of the show, KD. Uh, what do you call, consider a staple in mono white decks? Oh, we're talking about Magic the Gathering. Uh, planes. Planes. Yeah, planes are very important. Uh, Swords to Plowshares, Path to Exile. Uh, I like Mana Tithe, but people, it's, I think it's fine. Re- uh, reprise now. Uh, reprieve. Reprieve, yes. Reprieve. reprieve. That's a very good one. Uh, any of those one mana instant speed does something, draw card cards. All righty. <laughs> we're so, we're, we've lost our fucking minds on it's like so fucking hot in here too <laughs> if you were creating an overpowered game what would be something you would change or add i assume this is D D, not magic but uh yeah what would you change or add to make an overpowered game 
Uh, free feet every level. That's good. Free feet every level. <laughs> uh, I would increase the amount of spell casting that could be happened. Um, either. Ooh, yeah. Two actions a turn. Oh, two actions a turn would be a, a, a bonkers one. That would that would be fucking ludicrous. Also, some way for like that the mass the the super healing to happen. Yeah, that kind of healing that the old twenty fourteen life cleric that they took away the ability yeah. to do, or just max out all healing spells, like any die roll. Yeah, just maxed out. Uh, I need a funny name for a rogue gnome with split personalities. One personality is like is lawful good, and the other is chaotic evil. Those are two. Like the most diametrically opposed uh, alignments you could possibly have. That's, I think, the point. Jekyll and Hyde. Um, um, bean and bean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's a good dry rub for pork? Me. Oh. Anything uh, in a bottle that says dry rub. <laughs> do you think... Uh, ooh, do you- ooh, ooh. Serious answer, though? Paprika? Cumin? A lot of cumin. A lot of cumin. Go heavy on the cumin. Cumin is delicious. Salt, pepper, mustard, powder, onion powder, garlic powder. Go heavy on the garlic powder, too. Garlic, basically, just take a bottle of garlic powder, take a bottle of cumin, put them together in a thing, and then, like, put some other shit in there. Uh, do you guys think 1D&D is good? Yes. Uh, I think it is morally great. Oh, that's <laughs> morality. Uh, one D, it's in a good spot as a game right now. Yes. Does it need to exist? No. Is it nice that it does exist and make some improvements that of some weirdness from fifth edition? Yes. Should they just call it five point five instead of fifth edition? Yes. Is the VTT cool? Yeah. Is the support for D and D Beyond cool? Yeah. We'll see how that plays out when it's actually out because that's more important than any promises they're making right now. Uh, thoughts on the ranger slash monk class? I don't know if this is a ranger monk multi class or just the general rangers and monks. Well, as we discussed in the episode, they're in a much better spot. Uh, the the in terms of multi classing, their skills overlap perfectly with mm-hmm. dexterity and wisdom. Uh, don't really know why you would do it because the features in and of themselves don't really synergize very right. well. Right. I mean, if you. I mean, dipping into Monk just to get, like, that extra little bonus action punch on something, if you're, like, a melee ranger, and then uh, I, I, the being able to use your your formerly key points, now discipline points, to, like, bonus action step of the wind, that'd be kind of it. Yeah. They, they, they would deflect missiles for, like, the fucking ranger battle. Ding, ding, ding. What? Hey, oh. Uh, oh, America. Merka uh, says, this is an MTG. There's nothing to shred now. Maybe a character sheet? Mm-hmm. Merka, uh, a, a a new regular in our Monday Night Magic live streams where you play Magic the Gathering live on TikTok every Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard. Time. Keeps telling us to shred the cards. Yeah, we don't do that because some of them are expensive. And we like to have stuff. Yeah, we do like having stuff. Probably How much, much stuff do you need to be happy? <laughs> I'm still looking for that number. Uh, there are two pigs in front, two... In front of two pigs, two pigs behind two pigs, and two pigs in between two pigs. That wasn't a question. As a beginner GM, how do you in combat? <laughs> you can't just you can't just move on to the next thing. Like you didn't just read what you read. Uh, <laughs> you don't get to, you don't get to behave like that. I do. It's my It'd podcast. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, as a beginner GM, how do you how do you in combat if the player wants to defend? As a, as a beginner GM, how do you do combat if the players just want to defend, maybe? Well, are they defending something? Presumably, they would be defending something or someone and locking down an area. Like, 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 your, like your last stand kind of vibe, you know? You're under siege. Yeah, yeah. So, a couple things. I would pick or roll for a number of turns to pass. Mm-hmm. At least, at least probably like four wouldn't probably go more than like seven, something in that range, and throw a ton of weak enemies. A ton of weak. Like I'm talking, I'm talking like overrun with like twenty enemies, but every single one will pretty much immediately drop if they get hit by They have something. one hit point, basically. Yeah. Making making them literally one hit point 
would be awesome because then you have this moment where you're part like in uh, the Fellowship of the Ring when they're in the Mines of Moria and they're just completely and they're just you they run in and mowing things down or they're locking down an area they're like shoulder to shoulder and every time something something gets close to them maybe they're like holding their actions and they let loose and it just fucking splats in front of them mm-hmm. is cool and then when that turn threshold comes. At whatever point that is, you can make it random. You can predetermine it. You can also make it dynamic to how they're performing. Maybe they're getting the shit kicked out of them. Then you have the rallying reinforcements of good NPCs that work their way from the back. And then by the time they meet in the middle, all the enemies are gone combat over. Yeah. I would also, I you know, if you want to go that way, or an, another option is to, if you make this determination of, here's how long... You have to hold out. You know, the reinforcements are coming. You have, yeah. you have, however many, you can even extend your rounds. You don't have to do six seconds. You don't have to be like, they're 10 minutes away. So we have to do, uh, we have to do 600 60 rounds of combat. <laughs> no, you can always, you can always be like, all right, well, this round of combat, you're, this is a minute. You have, you know, whatever. Um, is a minute. What would you like to do? Smash as many things as you can. Perfect. What spells would you like to cast? Oh, you want this area of effect and then you want to buff up and heal people and like keep people topped up on health. All right, let's roll a bunch of dice. You can do mul- yeah, multiple rounds at once. Uh, KD, again, I'm building a mono white cat deck for my daughter. Any recommendations? Cat deck. Uh, Felidar Retreat. Felidar Retreat is very good. Felidar uh, Prowler. Yeah. Um, um, oh, what other mono white cats? See, uh, a good, a really, unfortunately, the really good cats deck is also the cat's dog deck, which yeah. is Ren and Siri. Uh, and that is a really expensive card. Mm-hmm. It's twenty bucks. Well, there's also um, oh, there's the one that's uh, Gruel Green Selesnia. That when oh. you create a token, you get you get either the cat or the dog. That's, that's three colors. That's Ren and Siri. That is Ren and Siri. That's Ren and Siri. That's a twenty dollar card. That's a twenty dollar card because it was never printed in a set. It was only in a secret layer and a buy a box. Really? So Salem is building that for another one of our friends right now, and they it's on finding... arena. It's on arenas though. It wasn't released in any set. It was a buy a box, and it was uh, and uh, and uh, secret layer for the cute one. How is it on arenas then? Oh, uh-huh. it's a good card. It's a good card. Yeah, it's a great get, card. Play it on arenas all day long. It's great. <laughs> but yeah, uh, mono white cats. I'm not sure. I'm sure there's a lot of uh, out there, but Felidar Retreat is Ooh. my is my first thought. Uh, Leonin Light Scrab. Ooh, or Leona and Leona War Leader. Yeah, yeah. Look into the Leonin cards. There's a lot of good Leonin cards. Uh, Grandmaster Assassin says you have both lost the game. <sighs> I am Apex. No, uh, no, no. We're done. There's an we're, actual question. Oh, okay. Fine. I have a campaign going with four friends, but one of them is recently hit and miss uh, with showing up. Any ideas on how to make that work? Just pretend like they're not there. Uh, so here's the thing um this is also you have to make a determine if this is an in-game thing that you want to fix or an out-of-game thing you want to fix yes if it's an in-game thing you want to fix you can always you can always do this sort of either ignore them or they come in and out they're a guest star whatever if this is an out-of-game thing where it's like we make the we make the schedule we all agree to the day and then they don't show up or they they always cancel last minute then that might be a conversation to have with them outside of the game where you say hey man do you really want to play you're kind of fucking us over you, there's there's four yeah. of the, the four of the five of us really are are always excited to have this you know to get together and play but if you're not into it that's fine yeah just um because a lot of people come into this hobby not realizing how dedicated some people are to this hobby oh yeah um and it's completely okay to not be as as into it as as your friends are so i would i would uh you know figure out if you wanted to address that in or out of game it comes down to be mature have a conversation as is as most problems in life can be resolved by having a conversation have a conversation if you want to just resolve it in game though like it's a one-time thing whatever uh you can just have them be there, and then if combat happens, they support, or they just do their attack thing, and nothing else. And then you just kind of pretend they don't, they're not there the rest of the time. Yep. Uh, Grandmaster Assassin got the number one gifter badge, oh, and became you. the 19th member of the team. Thank Ooh, you, Grandmaster that. Assassin. I feel like we had 17 going into this live. Did we miss 18? I don't know. Math is hard. Math is hard. Is this... Okay. Well... I think it's about time we hit that old dusty trail as it is uh, almost two and a half hours in on this podcast and uh, it was supposed to be posted four and a half hours ago. Soul Reaver also got the number one gifter badge. Pirate Tom jumped in to say hi. Hello, Pirate Tom. 
Panda Hijinx says, what are we going over? I'm just I'm just a pal at the minute. And then got the number one gifter badge. I'm sorry, guys. There's so much. The guys, uh, 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 uh. Like like Connor was saying, we have been here for a while. We have we have gone through this entirety of the one D N D uh, playtest just put out, which was also very chonky. Oh, it was so chonky. It one D N D the playtest material is in a in a position right now where you can completely play it as any character. Mm-hmm. Any it, like there's multiple subclass options now for a lot of them. Uh, things have been reverted back uh, for a lot of these classes as well, so it's more compatible with stuff that's already been released. The rules are fairly normalized at this point. Uh, hopefully, at Gen Con, we can get our friends and play some one D and D combat. Smack them around. Yeah, not not like a regular session. Just be like, "Hey, I'm gonna run a combat for an hour. You can run a combat for an hour. Someone else can run a combat for an hour, and we'll fucking peace out." A little light ball paddling. Yeah, a little. Ooh. Ooh. That's anyway. hot. That's hot. That's hot. That's hot, man. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. This has been a wonderful podcast. We'll see you again in two weeks. We love you very much. And in the meantime, peace out.